Good evening and welcome to the Dome Tuffnell Park in North London for what promises to be a fine evening of chess boxing. Uh, on St. Patrick's Day, uh, no less, which would explain the get-up that I, Chris the General Levy, am wearing, and my co-host, Matt, no nickname, Lun. That was um, remarkably slow, Chris. Uh, I mean, it, did, you sort of, did you stutter over the fact that I don't have a nickname, or did you temporarily forget who I was? I was hoping you would interject with one. Oh, but, sorry, yeah. Um, Hi, I'm... Matt, no nickname, Lun, everyone. Happy, happy to be here with my, uh, my regular compatriot, uh, Chris Levy. Although, as you say that, rather rarely for us, we're going to be joined by a special guest for, uh, for the second and third bouts, aren't we, Chris? Yeah, none other than uh, former IBF lightweight champion of the world uh, and undefeated chess boxer, Terry Marsh. Terry, Terry Marsh, a man who knows quite literally everything there is to know about boxing and is a pretty decent chess player himself. I remember the first time I saw Terry play, him navigating through a rather tricky king and pawn ending with them absolutely superb technique. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think, I think it's hard. It, it's hard for someone coming into chess later in life and, and, and really sort of learning enough skills to go out and play in public with such a plum. So I, I, I honestly, I can't wait to commentate with Terry later. I think we're going to learn a huge amount, and I'm sure you guys will too. Uh, yeah, indeed. And I believe Terry was uh, a junior champion at his school when he was uh, playing chess as a child, taking it up at the, at the same time as boxing. So looking forward to his thoughts on both disciplines. Um, Matt, I do not want to cast aspersions over your boxing skill by any means. No, uh, however, by, however, by all means, feel free to do so. However, I'm equally looking forward to your erudite insights on the chess that we have. What do you think of the lineup that we have this evening in terms of chess skill? We, we have a really, really exciting lineup um, today. So we, we've, got, we've got four fights. Uh, the first is uh, David, the Northern Powerhouse, uh, Germany, versus Cameron Hurt Locker Little. Um, Cameron, a world champion himself, got that nickname from his uh, daring work uh, for the Ordnance Survey. A good chess player, uh, not quite as good as David, though. David making his chess boxing debut today is um, it, you know, he's about to 210 ECM. You know, really solidly built, very, very tall, muscular individual. But Cameron's six foot nine, got seven kilos on him, and is about about a 130 or so. So I think Cameron's extra extra boxing prowess um, should give him an edge there. It's just it's just a case of whether he can survive the chess against genuinely one of the top hundred players in uh, in England. Yeah, it's a classic case of boxer versus chess player, which always sets it up for an intriguing battle. Uh, in terms of people trying to steer the bout towards their particular strength. Now, when we say 210 strength, 130, 140 strength, what exactly do we mean by that, Matt? Like, uh, in layman's terms, just how good is that? Uh, well, I mean, in, lay in layman's terms, pretty close to master level, actually. And um, there are a number of former master titles, formal master titles, I should say, which we, we won't get into now for the sake of time and your interest. But no, David Jarmany is a, a serious player, a serious man, and I think he's going to give give uh, Cameron a, a good good go this evening. Um, the second bout is between uh, Gerard Ripper Riley, uh, you know, a young young um, man uh, who's uh, fought once, won once before, uh, playing a, a firm favourite at Tufnell Park, John the Brickwood. He's in his 60s. He's uh, also um, a, an architect, famed for carrying a hod full of bricks uh, to the venue with him as well, which we might see later. So one of your classic old man versus young man fights, which I'm sure we've all experienced. Although, frankly, from the shape that John's in, I find it hard to distinguish the two. I mean, it's, it's physique wise, I think they're both, you know, really strong trainers. Um, and John, fair play for getting in, but, but I think he'll be more than a test for the younger man here. So youth versus experience, and John knows a few tricks in the ring as well. I'm looking forward to seeing how that one plays up. Yes, and that's that's the first fight that Terry is going to commentate on. I'm going to step out the ring for that one, so you'll have Chris and Terry for that. Uh, then Chris is going to step out the ring for the third fight, and you'll have Terry and me talking about Dan the Taxman Mayfield versus Brian No Slack Mac. Brian Mack, a, he's a polyglot, speaks seven languages. He's a, um, an excellent saxophonist. And Dan the Taxman Mayfield is, uh, is good with accounts. Uh, seven languages, really, that's very impressive. Um, can't Frank, even name seven languages off the top of my head, I don't know about you. I mean, I can't even speak one, as viewers may have already come to the conclusion. 
Um, Brian is also, yeah, as you say, playing the saxophone. We won't reveal um, what he will be bringing to his entrance in terms of song choice, but we're told that he is actually going to be treating us to a performance as part of his entrance. So that is something to look forward to uh, as well. A rare musical treat for viewers of this channel. And the final fight tonight is between uh, Cheyenne Shah Zareen Deliab and Roger the Cannonball Baxter. So Cheyenne, a, a really, really impressive athlete, not that experienced a boxer, but has a huge pedigree in a number of different martial arts. Roger the Cannonball Baxter is a very, very experienced boxer and a very decent chess player. So um, yeah, I think that should be a really, really exciting headline fight. Uh, Cheyenne, in his first fight against Matt Crazy Arms Reed, showed that he's a decent chess player, played very, very solidly, a little bit unambitiously, but essentially didn't make a serious mistake uh, until the middle game end game transition where Matt's extra experience told. I think Roger might be the slight favourite there, but the boxing side, I think, is going to be really interesting. I mean, Roger, certainly one of the strongest players on show tonight uh, and a real, what we'd say, speed merchant in the game. So he naturally suits uh, the blitz game and we'll talk a little about the, the clock a little bit later. Uh, but Roger is also looking in very good shape. Uh, he's really trimmed down and he's been sparring very hard. I've been along actually since our last, our last broadcast to Islington Chess Club just to see uh, how things are coming along and you know, strap on the gloves a bit just for old time's sake. And Roger is fast improving, almost as I say at the rate that Cheyenne's chess is improving. But again, you have that classic boxer versus chess player mm. strength, slight differential, which really does make this all the more intriguing. And I'm really looking forward to that one as a headline bout. And actually, for, for those of us who um, who are viewing the stream for the first time, uh, it may have been a while since they last saw a chess boxing bout. Uh, Chris, can you give us a bit, a bit of a rundown on the rules? Uh, certainly, so it's alternating rounds of chess and boxing, as the name would suggest. Uh, the chess is managed by a clock, which are both sets to have a certain amount of time for each player. A fairly short amount of time by chess playing standards. Uh, and what this means is that after, I think it's four or five minutes, the board is taken out, the game is paused, uh, both fighters go to their corner, get the gloves strapped on, uh, and they have a regular two-minute round of boxing. Assuming that is then survived, you then bring the board back in at exactly the same moment that you left off. So it's almost like you're playing a regular game of speed chess, just as it happens to be interspersed with uh, about a round of boxing. And then you just do this until somebody wins one way or the other, mm -hmm. checkmate or knockout. Um, or you know, you know, other ways of ending a game of chess, and indeed a bad box that we can talk about a little bit later. But that's the, the basic concept. And, uh, and if there's a draw in, in the chess, so it, it's bookended by, by the chess, so you always have one extra round, you begin and end with, with the chess. Uh, if the chess ends in a draw, then we go to one final round of boxing, which then might be determined by a points decision. But as a hybrid sport, one of the really fascinating things about this, and, and Chris and I were talking to Terry Marsh about this earlier, it's something that really appealed to him, is that your strategy is determined in both disciplines by how well you're doing in the other. So if you're doing really badly in the chess, you might have to go all guns blazing in the boxing in order to have a chance of winning overall. Similarly, if you're doing rather well in the chess, then it might uh, benefit you to take a slightly more circumspect approach in the boxing. As, as Terry described it, like Abbott and Costello running round and round the ring uh, to make sure that no one gets a punch on them. And, um, it... ooh, I think we're ready to start, Chris. I think, I, go on. I think we're going, think we're going to ha uh, hand over to our host, Gemma, uh, to introduce the evening's entertainment uh, in a slightly more professional way, perhaps, than we have done. <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to this with you guys. Please stay tuned on Twitch, uh, on Twitch forward slash London Chess Boxing. Uh, we're going to move to our host, Gem Carmella, for the start of the live show. I can't wait. Let's enjoy this.
Patrick's Day Bash! Are you ready to have some fun? Yeah! I'm coming down! Let's do this! Make some noise for me! Yes, London! Oh, skipping in the ring. Here we go. Hello to this beautiful audience and to everyone watching us at home on Twitch. How are you doing? Yeah? Everyone got enough toilet roll for the next two weeks? I know. Mad times, mad times. But we're here, we're gonna have some chess boxing antics for you tonight. Yes. So, brings me to the all important question. What is chess boxing? Who's been here before? Give me a cheer. Okay, so we've got some people that are rehearsed in, in the ways of chess boxing. Who is a chess boxing newbie tonight? Anyone at home too? Yeah, quite a few in the audience and also watching at home. So let me briefly, in a nutshell, explain what chess boxing is. Basically, there's a round of speed chess followed by a round of boxing. Then there's another round of speed chess followed by another round of boxing and so on until someone wins by either checkmate or a knockout. <laughs> Sound all right? Yeah. Newbies, do you think you understand the rules? Yeah. yeah, you got this. You got this. All right, now we are in the legendary Tufnell Park Dome in London tonight. <laughs> It's all right, isn't it? It's all right. Used to be a bathhouse once, bit of trivia for you. It was also uh, where Anthony Joshua had his first ever fight in 2009. That's right. And not only is it a place of past legends, it's also a place of current legends. So let me introduce you to our chess boxing team. Joining me in the ring already, England women's chess captain, women's international chess master, and your arbiter for this evening, Camel Bhatia! Give her a huge round of applause! Yeah, chess, chess, chess indeed. And uh, we also have someone refereeing the boxing. Here he comes, all the way from Cuba. Yes! General legend, ex-junior amateur world boxing champion, and our referee for the for the night, Ronaldo Domingo. <laughs> Total legends, and we have two more legends for you in the commentary box. Our very own commentators for the evening, chess boxer Chris, the General Levy. <laughs> yeah, that's right, Chris. And Matt Lon. Yes, the word twisting commentary wizard himself. <laughs> and we have a really, really special guest in here with us this evening. We are joined by undefeated IBF light welterweight world champion Terry the Fighting Fireman Marsh, who will be joining commentators as a very special pundit later. You are lucky, aren't you? We have got such a show in store for you tonight and four whole bouts of chess boxing to look forward to. So are you ready to get started? <laughs> yes, you are. So our first bout is going to be a bout of the heavyweight and I'm going to bring in our first chess boxer. He hails from Blackburn. Any Northerners in? <laughs> There's one really loud Northerner over there. I don't know if you heard him back home. He's in the house. Uh, shout out for some Northerners. Yes. Uh, so uh, David, our first chess boxer in the ring, he says his hobbies include um, ferret rearing and pigeon fancying. Sounds like a really interesting bloke to me. <laughs> he said in preparation for this event, he has also given up lovemaking for two months. Well, David, if you call it that, 
it sounds like you have been giving it up for much longer than two months to me, but hey, who am I to judge? Who am I to judge? So let's make some noise in the black corner, weighing in at 97 kilograms, standing at 188 centimetres. Make some noise for David Northern Powerhouse Germany! cheer for the Northern Powerhouse! Okay, so joining him in the ring and representing the South... <laughs> South is in, now's your time to cheer. Uh, our next chess boxer, he received his nickname, which is the Hurt Locker, because his previous job included him disposing of bombs. Oh yeah, he's a badass. He's a badass, all right. Uh, and just like his ground investigation technique, he says his jab is known to be extremely probing. And with a height of, ooh, 104 kilograms, I think he's got quite a long reach. Watch out for this one. Let's bring him in, in the white corner. Weighing in at 104 kilograms, make some noise for Cameron Hurt Locker Little! interesting bout of the heavyweights. Are you ready for your first bout of chess boxing? Yeah? You ready? I'm ready. Give it up for Cameron Hurtlock a little and David Northern Powerhouse Germany! So Matt, this is what we've all come for, some live chess action. I'm really looking forward to this one. Yeah, me too. I, I think the fact that Cameron's got the white pieces is particularly significant. I think ha if David were to have the white pieces in this game, given his uh, additional chess strength, then there's a danger it could be over all too quickly. Whereas Cameron can play in a way that plays an advantage to his additional boxing expertise. So yeah, I think we're in for a really good fight. Exactly, playing, playing white gives you a chance to dictate uh, to a certain extent, the style of opening. So, if I was Cameron, I'd be looking to just keep it tight. Um, you know, nothing too crazy in the early exchanges. 
and we're off. Matt, some early action. What are we seeing here? What, what are your objectives at the start of the game? Oh, goodness. So da David, David Germany has played the Elephant Gambit, uh, which suggests his intent to mix things up early on, utilizes additional chest strength to actually create some problems for Cameron, who is maybe just that little bit more experience in the boxing. Bishop e2, an unusual move. I imagine white is probably going to play e4 here. So, so when you say e2, what, what do you mean here? Sorry, Sorry. yes. Yeah, so the chessboard is a grid with h1 in the bottom right-hand corner and a8 in the top left-hand corner. So when we say knight to c3, for instance, you can use it as a grid to work out what we're saying. But um, yeah, really, really interesting opening choice by David. Smixing things up in a big way. David's a pawn down at the moment, but he's got his pieces in the middle of the board and he's already created, oh God, I think that's, I think he's lost a piece. I think he can play G5 here and he has! He's played G5 and now the bishop, oh, oh, knight takes G5. So Cameron didn't have much choice there, but David already has an advantage. A big, big advantage. That's an early blow for Cameron who wouldn't have seen that coming. Yep, I mean, to lose a piece early on, that's quite tough. Cameron now is in what he should be doing, which is slowing down and thinking a little bit. Yeah, he's not slowing down at all, though. Queen to d2, a good move, castling into safety. Now, if white were to castle kingside, there is a danger that David could swing his heavy artillery into the game and cause some problems. So I like that. That's a nice, pragmatic idea. I think black's a little bit better, and Cameron is going to have to come out in a big way in the boxing to really take advantage of that. Yeah, we've already got the, the imbalance here, so really, Cameron is going to have to come out aggressively. That said, you know, the, the standard of chess <laughs> tends to naturally drop a little bit after, after some boxing. So Cameron will have chances here, probably around the fact that David's king is exposed. Yeah, h4 is a glorious move to play against someone who is almost of master strength, really showing him absolutely no respect whatsoever. Just <laughs> chuck his pawns up the board, say, I don't care how good you are, I'm going to checkmate you, and no mistake. It's, it's, it's the box chess equivalent of the haymaker, I think. If it, if it connects, it's really going to be uh, lights out. But the chance of it connecting, we'll see. Yeah, bishop to f3 is a, an interesting move now. So Cameron, I think castling king's, uh, queenside sorry, is definitely the way forward. I think having said that, black's plan is just that little bit, little bit more... I, I don't know. I think, I think black can develop his pieces in a more natural way than white. I think white has to play h5, h6, and try to make something work on that side of the board. David, despite his slightly open king, is reasonably solid, but actually, there's a fair bit of play for white here, and I don't think David will be thrilled about how things have gone after, uh, after that early piece sack. No, Cameron's re recalibrated quite well. Uh, he's recovered, and actually, he's pushed on again. And that's the bell! <laughs> <laughs> a, a, a good old-fashioned pawn race coming up here, Matt. Yeah, I, oh, that's... Uh, it's what I like to see. I mean, some people, they do like a good little slow maneuvering game for the, for the connoisseur, but here it's just, I'll shove my h pawn, you shove your a1, and let's see which gets there first. Yeah, but it's a pawn race that David isn't going to want to see. I mean, like, I don't think David would have envisaged ever being at risk in the chess. Playing something like the Elephant Gambit means that White has to play very, very accurately in order to obtain a quick advantage. Now, he rightly uh, detected that Cameron wouldn't know the theory, quickly got a good position, but actually, Cameron's piece for two pawn sack turned out to be a decent practical choice. Now, he could have moved this bishop back to g3, and then f4 would have just left David with a really, really nice position. But white is actually looking pretty decent. Now, I feel, in a long play game, black has enough solidity to to make it through and to make his position work. Because uh, if white doesn't checkmate, then black is just going to win. But actually, that h-pawn is moving up the board far more quickly than black's a-pawn. And, um, and yeah, is I, I like that. And is unopposed as well. And is unopposed, and is unopposed too. Now, given it's speed chess, both sides have to play quite accurately. One big mistake can, can send the other flying. So. Uh, yeah, now we've got a boxing round as well. Cameron ostensibly the favorite here. Maybe just like Cameron turned the tables on David in the chess, David can do something similar in the boxing. I mean, that is a man, that is a man who knows his way around a gym, isn't it, Chris? I mean, they're, they're both in very good shape. Cameron is, uh, as you alluded to, the slightly more experienced boxer, but David is, you know, trained very hard in a very short period of time and his, so what his the standard is quite high. 
Yeah, David, I mean, David's an excellent rugby player, and I, I don't know what the kind of interdisciplinary approach of that is. There doesn't tend to be much crossover between the two, but David is not going to go down easily. Okay. Um, and actually, that brings me on to my question. Like, what does Cameron's extra height give him? As it, is that an advantage, do you think? Um, you could say it's a little bit like playing white in the chess. It gives you perhaps more ability to dictate if your fitness level is high. So you can try and keep David at distance with the jab, which is the fundamental punch in boxing, uh, the front hand. Um, it's not the most powerful punch, but it lets you keep your opponent at bay. And as the taller man, uh, and Cameron's very good at doing this, he's going to want to keep Matt away from him at the end of that jab, whereas... David is going to try and get up closer and pound away to the body, I would suggest. Uh, uh, and that's, that's the bell, a uh, good, good fist, fist bump there. David with a sort of... It's a two, it's a two minute round, so the chess, the chess is three minutes each, the boxing is two minutes each. Goodness, okay, so well, what's happening here, Chris? Like David seems to be off to quite an energetic start. There's, there's lots of movement, um, and I'm enjoying David's upright, slightly old school style. It reminds me of some of the brawlers uh, back in the day, uh, going a hundred or so years back, but it's kind of feeling each other out. It's very pugilistic, isn't it? It's the sort of like eld elderly Victorian gentleman on the unicycle looking to knock the other person's monocle off. Yeah, a good right connected there for Cameron, the first uh, heavy punch of the fight, and a good left hook as well. So Cameron is now starting to assert himself a little bit after a, a feeling out period. He's landed a couple of power punches. When I say power punch, that's anything other than the jab that uh, I was talking about at the beginning. So there's a left hook and a straight right that landed from Cameron. But David seems to take a while. Oh, yeah, a, a, a coughing right from Cameron. There. So I think Cameron's starting to assert his boxing experience a little bit here. What do you make of David's footwork, Chris? Uh, it's certainly energetic. Um, I would like to see him, as the shorter man, try and plant his feet and throw uh, a powerful shot of his own, just to try and you know, remind Cam he is in a fight. And then, uh, as I say that, another strong right lands on David. So it's, it's as you said, it's the inverse of the chess. But I mean, this is—I mean, this is David's first fight. It's a very, very decent start, and Cameron is no easy first opponent. I, I think David would have expected to uh, to have gone into this with a little bit more of an advantage in the chairs, and that might have led to him adopting a, a, a slightly more aggressive approach, which maybe isn't paying off. Yeah, and Cameron, Cameron is, um, however, in the reigning heavyweight champion in chess boxing. So. Yes, on a pure chess basis, uh, David is going by far the stronger. However, um, Cameron is more of a friendly transition that we have now, uh, which is really the danger point in chess boxing when you change from the boxing to the chess, it's really no problem the other way around. But when you've just gone through this round and you have the adrenaline coursing through your veins, this is where what we call the Jaffa can happen, which is <laughs> which is when you make that corker of a mistake in the, in the first move after after the boxing and that has eventually just ruined a very well played game. And I think if one person is gonna make a Jaffa, Cameron is slightly more likely to, not because of the way the boxing has gone. But David is such a good chess player. He, not only is he gonna be able to play on intuition a bit more easily, even if he's uh, slightly discombobulated, um, but he's more likely to use his time effectively. He's not the kind of player who's gonna come in and just play a move and realize it's a problem. I think both guys can, can move their pawn forward next regardless. Cameron is gonna play h5, h6. David is gonna play uh, a4 to a3. Well, David David perhaps a few has a few more choices and then kind of take it from there. Yeah, I wanna see David play for a central pawn break actually, meeting meeting the flank attack in the classical manner. And you know, you can also try and play against the advanced d5 pawn break. The bishop b7 adds a bit of pressure to it, but the bishop on f3 does add it, add a very good level of protection to it. But that's possibly another plan. Well, actually, and, and we we're are, back! We have a pawn race here, Matt. What do you mean by a pawn race? Well, David is chucking his pawns down the uh, queen side, and White is chucking his pawns up the king side. So uh, neither of them are opposed by pawns. Oh, he's played a3, so he's threatening to take on b2. Oh, and Cameron has stopped it. Really, really nice stuff here. Neither player completely discombobulated by the uh, flurry of pugilistic activity that we just saw. So uh, a really, really solid, sensible start by both players, which is what we like to see. And let's have a look at the clock times. Cameron is about a minute ahead, which at the moment isn't counting. But if it goes a little bit deeper, then having that extra time is 
really quite an asset. Yeah, I think David's extra experience means he's likely to play uh, under time pressure a lot better than Cameron. But I, I think Cameron's plan here, just playing h6, has he? Oh, he's done it! He's played h6! The pawn is so close to the Black King! And Knight back to h7. A solid, solid move. Now, I don't know if he's threatening to take on g5 here, because if the Queen takes and that attack keeps going, Rook g3, King to h8. Really, really classy, high-quality chess by both sides. Everyone's in for a real treat. And Bishop, oh, Bishop to H5! Like the Queen I is like under that. threat! The Queen is under threat! And David coolly moves it out the way. Cameron is really not being intimidated by David's chess here. He's playing a very aggressive style. Yeah, and, and, and of course, ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are new to chess, if the pawn gets to the other end of the board, that's an extra queen, and an extra queen will surely win the game for white. But that's why that knight on h7 is so important. It's blocking absolutely everything. Bishop back to, oh, f4. If he plays f4, I think he's gonna win a piece. If the pawn two in front of the black rook moves, it attacks the bishop, it attacks the rook. That's called a fork, and you can't defend both pieces. And he's done it! What he's played f4. Rook g7, but then take the bishop. Oh, rook to g7 is a really interesting move, and he's, he's played, played it! it. He's, oh, he's played, played it. it! What a move! Chris has found it. So now, can what can Black take on e3? If he takes on e3, takes the bishop, white would take the queen, and then Black could take the queen with check. He would have an extra bishop, and he's done it! He's found the move! The tables are turning! Oh, I don't think Cameron saw that coming, and queen takes is a really, really sensible move. Now, white is quite a bit of material down. He's only got two major... He's only got a knight and a bishop. Black has a knight, another knight, and two bishops, but that rook is right in the heart of Black's position. And I think Black's got a bit of a bit of a challenge here. Oh, E4. What's E4 threatening, Chris? Um, well, uh, oh, hang on. It's moving on very quickly. I mean, yes, oh, Black, Black, yes, oh, that's Bishop what he's four, threatening. Skewering the queen to the king. The queen can't move because white would then be in check. What a fantastic plan from David. And that's the bell. That's the bell. And Carl, oh my giddy arms. I mean, until that, until that uh, pin there, it really was, I thought Cameron had compensation because yes, David had the extra pieces, but they were all sat there on the queen side doing nothing. E4 was an absolute humdinger of a move, a howitzer, and Cameron really needed to take some time at that point. He really needed to play a move like Oh, I don't know, rook to h4 or something, just to cover that square. Because honestly, if he'd taken a bit more time at that moment, David might have been in a bit of trouble because he had a real attack going. But I think he just missed bishop f4, bishop f4. No. And it's a complex position, but I think it's one that Black is going to come out of with an advantage. Yep, yeah, um, one that I think this is going to be harder now to go. Cameron can't come back against a man of this quality being a queen down. So I think now it's really the emphasis is on the boxing for Cameron. And while he clearly won the first round of boxing, he's going to have to be looking for a knockout because maybe you can just about get through one more round of Queen Down. But I think not with that much material on the board. David's just going to whip up an attack and finish things off. Yeah, I, I think... I think that things are simplifying in the chess and are simplifying in a way that gives David a big material advantage. And if that happens, David is far too good a player to let that slip, even if he's down on the clock. So there's a lot of pressure on Cameron in the boxing now. Let's see if his extra experience tells. And let's see how David plays this one, because a smart move would be, yeah, to really get on his bike, as we say, and um, circle the ring. But if anything, I think he wants to show that he's got a bit more in the locker with his boxing skills. As I say, he has been trained very hard. He's in excellent shape. And he's really taking it to Cameron uh, at the start of this third round and second boxing round. Yeah, slightly, slightly idiosyncratic, as, as you uh, as you imply, Chris. I mean, now he's he's finding himself in something something of a grapple. But uh, I, I, I've got to say, I, I, I love David's moxie here. Like, he really didn't need to go out all guns blazing. Unless there's something in the chest we've missed, of course. Uh, Chris, it, it's all happening in a bit of a flurry there, as well as in the ring. It is. This one's not going to go the distance, for sure. But it's been a thrilling fight. We think we know how it's going to end. But Cameron has a minute left still. He's going to have to try and reassert himself after that 
a strong first minute from David in the boxing. Yeah, I think I think the shorter boxing round should go in David's favour here because it makes it far less likely that he's going to go down to a, uh, oh, a sudden uh, punch. That was a strong left hook. There was a, a backhand lead from Cameron followed up by the left hook. Uh, that certainly rocked David a little bit. He looks okay though. He, 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 he looks he looks all right as he pushes Cameron into the corner of the ring there. Yeah, so this is a very smart move. If you know that you're ahead uh, on the chess, then you can take a little bit of the sting out of the boxing by by holding. Uh, and referee Ronaldo Dominguez will separate them, of course. But that sucks up the sucks a bit of time, gets you a bit closer towards the end of the round. And now Cameron's got 20 seconds to force the stoppage. Tried a right hand haymaker there, missed by a fair old distance, but he's trying. He's, he knows what he has to do. Yeah, and, oh, yeah that, that was a, that was a, that was a strong right that landed. An interesting Five round. Five seconds. Three. Uh, yeah, and still I mean, Cameron has. Yeah, he kind of leveled things off there after David surprised him in the first 20, 30 seconds of the boxing. David came out with an unexpected uh, attack. Cameron then just kind of adjusted, slowly re uh, reasserting the jab and landed a couple of strong power punches there. So now we get to the question, which is, can Cameron draw this out? Uh, well, actually, I've just had a look at the, uh, at the board again, and the answer is almost certainly no, because I think... I, I, I think David's just winning a rook here um, after Bishop takes E3 check and then Knight takes D7. Yeah. So I think the chess is potentially over. However, Cameron is not obliged to resign this position. He needs to keep playing. He can't stall because Cameron will intervene at that point and, and stop him from doing that. But if he can last one more round of chess, then he's got another round of boxing at his disposal where he's got that final opportunity to knock David out. But I think the chess, assuming David spots this, which a player of his ability surely will, uh, I think the chess is basically over. Yeah, I mean, you say he can't stall, but he can certainly, let's say, take a little bit more time over his moves in a very deliberate manner, um, I, might re I might recommend. Yeah, and Cameron, Cameron does have extra time on the clock here, which is a relief. Like, if he only had, say, a minute left, I think this would be over. Um, but but he's, got, he's got the time to try and do something. He's still got that advanced H-pawn, and the Queens have come off the ball, which means it's going to take David a little bit of time to rally his pieces round. But, um, yeah, I... I don't know. I, I I don't think Cameron will win on time because I think David is just too good for that. Le oh, and it's Bishop takes E3. Now David's got a good move. If he sees Knight takes D7, the chess is surely over because he'll be a whole piece and a rook up. He hasn't played it. He hasn't played. He's played Knight to G5. Oh, that's a let off for Cameron because he could have taken the rook. He could have taken the rook on D7, which was just hanging. Now Cameron has to spot it. He has to spot that his rook's being attacked. That's the only. Oh, he's missed it. They both. They oh both my word. It entirely. Oh my word, ladies and gentlemen, they are completely discombobulated. Now by the he's found it. Now he's it. Found it. Oh no. Oh no, what a calamity for the Hurt Locker. He had such a great opportunity there. If he moved his rook to e7, then there was still so much to play for. But he's got a bit of time on the clock. If, if he can last one more round of chess, then he still has some boxing to go. He still has some boxing to go, and that is the only way, the only way he can generate something from this. The queens are off, Matt, and that I think is quite important because although David clearly has the material advantage, without the queens, it takes you longer to whip up an attack and make that, that pay. So if I was Cameron, I would just be taking a little bit of time here and trying to draw this, draw this enemy game out as much as he can. And he does have that quite menacing pawn mass as well, both he, in the center and the H pawn. He, he does has the assets. He does indeed. And Bishop back to F5 was a very, very clever move, just blocking off that rook from hurtling down into White's kingside position. Now, it is going to take a little bit of time for David Jarmany playing black to make something of his extra pieces. I'm pretty sure we're going to see another round of boxing. Oh, and he's won a rook! He's won a rook. Now, David has got a lot of material. I don't think it matters an enormous amount. Black is still clearly winning. I, I think both sides, both sides have been rattled by the boxing, but we're definitely going to see another round. Yeah, Cameron struck back there. We've got a minute left, and it's definitely... Oh, uh, would you have taken that? 
Would no, you, no, no, I would not. Now, Cameron has a bunch of extra pawns here. This is still winning for White, but actually, that is a lot of extra material. That's a lot of extra pawns that can hurtle up the board and potentially become a queen. I think David will win this. Oh, that's a very, very sensible move. Now, that e-pawn is very, very weak. Very weak. He's just stopping it from moving forward. Knight back. And he's won a pawn! He's won a pawn. Now, this is the advantage of having all these extra knights. All these extra knights can just... Pick up, pick up the various pawns, and then Cameron has no chance. But, but, there is still time in the boxing. Oh, oh dear, oh dear. Cameron really needs to slow down. And now really needs to slow down, take his time, be a bit more circumspect, because his king doesn't have that many squares. That said, they're both getting down to nearly a minute. So this is going to come, you know, even if it does come to another chess round, it's going to be a mad time scramble where anything can happen when you're deciding to move. Well, knight three, five, is, is rookie three mate? Is rookie three mate? No, king can go to b4. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen, I got a little bit excited there. And that is the bell. We'll see another round of boxing. I think Cameron did very well there. I mean, he, he picked up the rook. Picked up the rook for a piece. He did have those slightly menacing pass pawns, and then he managed to straighten them out as well. But where D David came back, I think was, he pinpointed it there, was putting the restraint on the e-pawn. Yeah, it's four connected pass pawns, and if the e-pawn gets up there in front of the phalanx, then that's really quite serious counterplay. But once he restrained it and picked it up, then I was control restored. Yeah, he, he, he did. He did do well after he lost the material. Uh, and both both sides uh, missing the fact that the rook was on pre on d7 was your classic Jaffa, Jaffa cake mistake. Um, because had David just taken that, he, he would have been clearly winning. Had Cameron seen rook to e7, then it would have all been to play for. Uh, and actually, there was a point where Cameron had a lot of pawns for those two knights. And whilst it was winning for Black, in practical terms, it would have taken a little bit of, uh, of work for Black to do something, given the fact that you have these connected pawns on G4, on F5, and, and the pawn on H6. But we've got one, only one more round of boxing here before going to the chess. If Cameron doesn't win this, if Cameron doesn't win this round, then David has surely won the battle. Well, as we said, the time is so short that yeah, you can have success in Jaffa's. I've, I've seen things like this happen. In, he, in yeah. previous, uh, even very strong players, I've seen you know, melt, melt somewhat under the lights once you've got the adrenaline coursing through your veins, especially if you're not that experienced at chess boxing. Yeah, but I think but David has David's time disadvantage is completely it's completely changed. David now has double the time that Cameron has. Um, so if anyone is going to make a jab, oh, I think it's oh, right left combo. Sorry to interrupt there, Matt. That's a very strong opening from Cameron. He's coming out throwing throwing bombs. There's a now switched away from the approach with the jab. Oh, David hits back with a right hand there and that forces Cameron back into the corner. Fighting fire with fire there, David Jarmine. I think it's a very exciting last round of boxing here. Yeah, oh, ho, ho, ho. That's, a, that's a heck of a punch, isn't it? Right right in the back. So, uh, you're not supposed to punch anyone in the back, only the back of the head, but it does happen. Um, but excellent in that, that occasion, no warning, nothing run out of it. But they're really, really giving it some in this last round. I'd say that's, they've thrown caution to the wind, the jab has been put away. And it's now all about trying to land those power punches. Yeah, I mean, Dave, David is a 65 seconds away from surely winning his first ever chess boxing bout and against the British champion, even though there isn't a belt on the line here. That'd be a huge boost to his confidence. Uh, I think I, I think David Jarmany is going to be a, a real, real figure in uh, in London chess boxing going forward. And he just needs to survive this. And he's he's looking pretty calm, isn't he? Cameron is just not getting enough. Oh, well, you no, know, he's on. landed a left hand. That I mean. Cameron is looking pretty determined. Oh, and a right almost thinks so. I think David is certainly puffing a bit now. Yes, he's staying calm, he's trying to stay moving. But this is Cameron's most impressive round, and you can really see that David is starting to puff at the end of this. He'll know that he's, even if he wins, he's definitely been in a fight. Cameron now got 20 seconds left, forces David the core, left to the body, goes to the hook. David's gonna get through it, but this has been a, a sterling effort from Cameron. But it's probably quite good for David to have uh, some stuff to work on in the boxing, to be able to face someone as experienced as, as Cameron. Uh, I imagine David's chest doesn't need any work from a chess boxing perspective. He's regularly going to be the best person. And that's the bell. That's the bell. Um, great effort by Cameron, though, right? Yeah, I mean, he came out, you could see the look on his face. And certainly those first 20, 30 seconds when he was throwing the combinations, he had David rattled there. 
Uh, so it looked for like there was a chance that the stoppage could be on. Uh, David then, yeah, rather than going into a shell, he covered up. Uh, he didn't cover up, rather. He started throwing back on his own, which is often a, a good strategy, as in chess, rather than simply trying to defend. Sometimes there are moments where the best form of defense is to start a counterattack. Um, and that's really what we saw there from David, just uh, asserting himself a little bit um, and showing that he wasn't too cowed uh, by the early assault. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think the fact that David was in that fight to such a degree is is like a terrific, terrific confidence boost for him going forward. Like he's a very athletic guy, but I don't think he's done a huge amount of boxing. So that's that's terrific. That is absolutely terrific. And I really, really think that he's going to be competing for belts very, very soon in, in what will surely be a debut victory for him. Definitely loved his entrance as well. A real crowd please, I think. Uh, I don't know how much he's playing to the uh, brooding Northern Mills stereotype, but... Uh, Everyone loves a hood, don't they? <laughs> uh, I really don't know how to answer that one. Um, but, yeah, maybe that's our costume for the next fight. Um, but w coming back to the chess, what do we expect to see with just a minute left on the clock for each player? I, I... And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. So... Where we left it, Cameron had a phalanx of pawns going up the board, threatening to get an extra queen. David really, really calmly manoeuvred his knights, won a key couple of pawns. Cameron is surely lost now, and his time is ticking down. He has just 45 seconds left. He's got to find a way to mix things up, but I think king to F h7 is a really good move. All David has to do is stop those pawns going up the board, and Cameron seems to have run out of ideas. But it's, anything can happen in a time scramble. So, yes, Cameron is down to 50 seconds. Oh, and he stopped it! Had he allowed that pawn to promote, it would have been Cameron's game, surely. But David is so experienced. He's promoted the queen, but no, the rook has just taken it. And I think this is going to be over really soon. Cameron has but 39 seconds left. He's got one pawn to David's two knights. And there is no way back into this. David just has to play sensibly and power through. Awesome. Yep, there, yep there, sh there should be a match of technique, but anything can happen. Cameron's down to the last 20 seconds. I think it's going to be the clock that decides here. <laughs> David has over a minute. Cameron, 20 seconds. We're, we're going to have to get a count from you soon, ladies and gentlemen. Cameron's clock is ticking down. David could potentially win another pawn with knight d3. The knight on f3 would then drop, but it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. David is going to win this surely, as long as he keeps his own clock in check. He's going for a think. Why is he going for a think? You might lose on time, David. He's got 50-odd seconds. Cameron's got 15. He's moved this king super quickly, super, super quickly. The rook has gone with check. Oh, oh, the king can go back to b4. I keep thinking yeah, it's, it's checkmate. It's close to mate. It's close to mate. So it's close to mate. Rook takes the d5. King takes a3. None of this matters. All that matters here is the clock. Ladies and gentlemen, Cameron is so, so close to letting his clock dip into nothingness. David has dropped a knight, though. Five, David's dropped four, a knight. Three. Oh, he's oh, just about oh, B4, move. B4, the rook was threatening mate. The rook was threatening mate, and now the knight comes back. So that was just very swing good into play. C4. Cameron did very well to see the checkmate with such little time on the clock. And now, Dave, David's down to about 20 seconds now. David is down to 20 seconds, but Cameron has lost another pawn. It's surely a matter of time. A really, really dignified end to the game by White, who's playing so quickly. He doesn't want to go out without a fight. This is superb, superb chess, ladies and gentlemen. The rook is moving. He knows he can't do anything else here. Cameron's clock has Cameron timed out. Oh, no, he's got like oh, he's one whooping. second. No, 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 you can't go right there. It's an illegal move. It's an illegal move. It's an illegal move. Oh, this always happens in a time scramble. David is gesticulating at the clock. He has to take it. It's a time it's scramble. It's a time scramble. It's over. It's, it's over. The game Referee is over. Conwell it's a David it win for David, the Northern Powerhouse Germany. What a fight. What a fight. And they're embracing, embracing like brothers, despite all of the medical advice. They're hugging. They're hugging, even though they probably shouldn't. North and South together. Truly a metaphor for our times quite superb. Okay. okay. E huh? On time since they Yeah. All right, my mic doesn't seem to be on. You know who's one. Okay. My microphone is not on, but we have a winner.
just going to project. Oh, there it is. We have a winner. Uh, due to running out of time in the chest, which is a thing, our winner is... <laughs> it happens. David Norman Powell! Uh, the probing jab, which you're very famous for. We saw that play out a little bit in the boxing. How did you find the bout? I thought I was ahead in the kind of opening middle game, and then I looked back at the board and I was like two nights down. <laughs> so. And then that was some really fast chess at the end there. What, what was going through your brain while you're moving all those pieces? Just instinct, carry on playing. And it was basically lost by that point. But you've got to, you know, carry on. You never know, you might make a blunder. So. Yeah, you made him suffer, I feel like. So come over, winner. How, you, how are you feeling, sir? I'm feeling like a pint. <laughs> He'd like a pint. Uh, anyone in the audience here might want to buy him one. Anyone at home, maybe you can uh, wave your cup of tea in, <laughs> in the screen. So, yeah, how did you feel about that boxing? Because it got tense. It was very tense. I mean, Cameron's a great boxer. He had me all over the place. And it was just fortunate that I was winning the chess. You really had remarkable composure with that chess, so well done to you, well done on your win. Let's give it up one more time for both our brilliant heavyweight chess boxers, Cameron Hurd of the Little, and your winner, David Northern Powerhouse Showman! We hope you enjoyed your first bout. We're going to take a little break, make yourselves a cup of tea. Everyone here, go and refresh your drinks. We'll see you back shortly. Thank you very much. Well done. Wow, that, was, that was absolutely superb, wasn't it, Chris? That was. I mean, what, what a fight. I, I, I think... Windsor Actuarial Consultants. Supporting London chess boxing. And from our sponsors, Windsor Actuarial Consultants. Was um, my co-commentator Matt Lunn is just switching out. I'm um, shortly to be joined by special guest this evening, former lightweight champion of the world, Terry Marsh. Terry, welcome to London Chess Boxing. Nice to be here, Chris. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, a chess boxer yourself. It takes me back to the bout that you had with I think it was Dima Agasarian a couple of nights ago, or a couple of years ago, rather. Yeah, that's right. Uh, ex chess boxer, I used to add. Well, no one, no one's ever an axe right. Been there, there's... got the t-shirt. <laughs> Been there, done it. Uh, Terry, what did you think of that uh, first fight from a, a boxing perspective? Uh, well, I can't really say from a boxing's perspective, in the sense because it's about a question of being whether you're jack of all trades or a master of, uh, of one. Uh, in this case, you know, the, the better chess player you are, invariably you're going to fall down on the boxing, and, it, and chess boxing is not different from boxing it's different from chess and so from that point of view it, the boxing was interesting and there one particular guy had to push it because his strength was boxing and the other guy of course he, his weakness was boxing so it, it doesn't actually become a, a boxing contest it becomes more of a spectator sport in the sense of uh, fox hunting where you've got the the, the, uh, the predator and the prey yep. and uh, in, in that sense it was I thought it was quite interesting yeah, because Cameron, you know, he, he had the worst position probably at the end of the first round, although he had his chances in it. 
but what he did quite well in terms of the metaphor, I think, is is uh, is the fox managed to keep running for almost to the end there? Yeah, he, he has to, his job in the chessboard. He was the master in in the boxing ring. He, he was the sort of a uh, the, the the prey, and it was a question of him having to survive, and he managed to do that. I, I think uh, Cameron perhaps should have been a little bit more aggressive and more forceful in, in the boxing. But uh, having said that, uh, you know they're heavyweights. So I was a light welterweight, and uh, so it's easy for me to say that with guys like that when the way they punch. Uh, or it should be punching, uh, it's, it's easier said than done. Yeah, you could see they were slowing down a little bit in that last time, but Cameron, I think, he did perhaps a little bit belatedly, but he did step up the aggression a bit. There was, there was some combination punching at the start of the, the last um, box round that we maybe hadn't seen from him quite so much when he was more working the jab, keeping it quite as no, technical as he could. Yeah, that, that's the case, and I, I think he should have started that out from the very beginning. And then at that time, hopefully, there would have been some mental fatigue on the part of uh, his opponent, who, who, who might have then been forced to make mistakes during the, the chess. Yeah, because it's, it's quite short in terms of round, I guess. So, um, yeah, rather than kind of working the way into the fight, it probably might have been a strategy knowing that you're uh, likely to be behind in the chess, just to come out all guns blazing from the off. Uh, I, I think that's what you got to do. If you, you are a better chess player than what your opponent is, a, a better boxer than what your own opponent is, like the regards to the chess, chess side of things, I think you have to try and take the advantage of that and use that as much as you can on what your strengths are and play to your strengths and exploit his weaknesses. Yeah. And uh, I think he failed to do that in the early stages. But having said that, he done well in the chess because although he ran out of time, his opponent, who I thought was superior in the chess playing, was uh, only 15 seconds behind him. <laughs> yeah, at the end, you know, yes, there was a clear advantage, but anything can happen in a time scramble like that. Um, as you know, being you know, really quite a strong chess player yourself, and we're very excited to have a, you know, a former title holder and undefeated boxer with us from that perspective. But Ree, you've been interested in chess quite a lot from a young age, Terry. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I played chess before I, I boxed, and uh, I was quite successful as a schoolboy, and I uh, won a London title, and I've always been following chess uh, since then. And I've got a very competitive brother, uh, so and, and now a competitive son as well. And so uh, from that point of view, I'm always playing chess within the, within the family. Uh, we don't actually go to any chess clubs as such, although in the past well, I've, I've indulged, uh, but circumstances don't permit now. But nonetheless, chess has always been sort of a part of my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people often say there's some similarities between both. Other people would say, yeah, it's completely different. One's, one's purely mental, one's physical. But actually, I imagine, you know, in both disciplines there's crossovers. So certainly, boxing is a lot more strategic than, yeah, the casual observer would would say. It's all about, you know, having plans um, and executing them in a ring. Equally, having a good physical state can help you maintain your concentration. And chest. I don't know. Do you, do you find there are any similarities, or do you find them to be Kind of diametric opposites. Oh no, very much. The principles the same, and that's uh, you know work to your strengths and exploit their weaknesses, whether it be chess or boxing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Terry, yeah, we're in, in the dome here. Anti Joshua had his first bout here. Do you remember where your first first bout was? Uh, uh, your first professional one, maybe? Or well, I actually remember when my very first fight, 11 years of age, was in Furban House in Canning Town. Uh, but I didn't know this was a. Uh, uh, Anthony Joshua's uh, debut uh, venue, but uh, so I'm, I'm kind of away with uh, a little bit more informed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're just about to hand back over to our MC Jammer. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll hand over to her and then. We are back in the room. Are you ready for our second bout of chess boxing? <laughs> Woo, so am I. And I love this one, it's the welterweights. And I don't know what, I love that word, welter, such a cool word. Uh, so, did you enjoy your first bout of chess boxing? It's good, wasn't it? It was a fruitful, eventful bout. And we've got more of that coming up. So let me tell you a little bit about our next chess boxer. He is an Irishman. And we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day today, so let's give him a bit of extra love. Very nice. He's also a first time chess boxer. So this is his first fight, yeah. And uh, it says here, he learns to play chess in order to get out of geography at school. 
Ironically, he is now a geography teacher. I know, it's funny how life works, isn't it? Uh, he said uh, his anti-rational boxing style matches his favourite type of coastal erosion. That, everyone, was a geography joke. Just shows how fun geography is, right? <laughs> Should we bring him out? Here we go, in the black corner, weighing 67 kilograms, bring in and give some love to Jared Ripper Riley! Here he comes. Give him some love! Geography never looked so good. So he's got a chest elo of 1784. His first chess boxing bout tonight. Give him some more love, Jared Ripper Riley! All right, who's joining him in the ring? Let's find out our next fighter was actually a bricklayer for 20 years. 20 years, long time. He also juggled bricks in a traveling circus in the southern states of the USA. Under the pseudonym, I like this one, Stanley Two Bricks. It's good, right? It's good. <laughs> he, in the ring, apparently he's known for his signature move, which is the swinging gate hook. I don't know what that looks like, so let's look out for it, see if we can spot it. Let's bring him in, in the white corner, weighing 68 kilograms, John the Brick Wick! <laughs> you get a brick! Yeah, John, John Wood, 62. He's got 32 years of experience on his younger opponent here. How impressive is this, uh, him taking to the ring? Uh, I'm actually lost for words because I'm looking at him and I actually feel like I'm looking in a mirror and seeing myself. Uh, but yeah, at 62, it's uh, quite a performance. I, I mean, I, I got into chess boxing very late, uh, something like 55, 56 and uh, quickly learnt that it was not a whole, an old man's sport and uh, retired at 57. But to be 62 and, uh, well, more, more power to his elbow and uh, he looks quite sprightly and uh, I, I don't know what his forte is, whether it's chess or the boxing, but uh, we're soon going to find out. We are off with the chess and you may have noticed I've been joined by Terry Marsh, former welterweight, like welterweight world champion and also a very strong chess player himself. Uh, what do you make of this opening? F3 is slightly unusual from John as White. 
Uh, well, at the moment, it's just a question of uh, shadow boxing, so to speak, uh, from a chess point of view. Yeah, it's all about developing the pieces. It's a slightly unusual opening from John. Normally, he wouldn't move that f pawn, the one that's just the right of his king, like that. And he's blocked in his bishop. So if you notice, that light squared bishop is hemmed in by pawns of the same square. Whereas Gerard has played a more conventional opening, uh, just developing his pieces towards the centre, which is the classical way that you want to do it. Yeah, well, I interrupted with his last move, uh, moving the knight onto the outside. But uh, at the moment, as I say, I see most of it as a uh, sparring and uh, testing each other's uh, uh, positions. Yeah, a knight on the outside. But, so yeah, a knight uh, on the yeah, now we're going to have the bishop come down and check the, uh, the queen, uh, the king. Yeah, rather. that's, that's Sorry, already that's exposed John, John there. That's... That's an early blow. John evacuates his king, so he's trying to run from that, but now the queen can come in, and that would look quite terminal if that happened. It wouldn't be checkmate immediately, but we could be seeing a very early finish here. Gerard is taking his time. It's beginning to look quite ominous from John, I must admit. I'm wondering if we might even see some boxing here. It's possibly the, not the best move to try and evacuate the king to f2. He should maybe have tucked it away in the corner and kept it away from the queen. But Gerard is having a think. He's just trying to make sure uh, before he executes this one. I think he may be coming down with his knight. Uh, it's, a question, it's an option between the knight or the queen. And I think he's just trying to decide which one to use. So that queen can come in with check, which would force the king to take another step forward to e3. And then I think he would have the quite devastating and actually terminal, just pushing the deep on forward one, is checkmate. Oh, he's playing to the crowd. What is he doing here? He's, he's got the moves, but he's playing to the crowd. It's almost like he wants to take this into the boxing. Yeah, I think you've actually uh, nailed it there. He wants to get a couple of rounds under his uh, belt, so to speak. Cause he's, he's now being kind to John. He's, he's got the knockout blow here. Surely he's seen it. Um, but yeah, I think he just wants to test it out in the ring. Sometime he's going to move the, uh, the uh, Queen's pawn uh, forward, I guess. Yeah, exactly. And then it just takes... Yeah, he'll force the, force the King forward and then checkmate with D4. But we are into a boxing round. So a little bit rash there, um, I think, from John. John's opening play was a little bit unconventional. He hemmed in his bishop, then he, you know, he rushed things. He let his pawn on h2 get taken. Yeah, I, I think he knows that as well. Looking at his body language as he's putting the gloves on. So he's got to pull something out of the bag in this round because uh, come the next uh, chess uh, round, then uh, I think it's a uh, good night. Yeah, I mean, Terry, it's obviously never happened to you being undefeated, but w what would it feel like from a boxer's perspective? Uh, I mean, this is the equivalent of losing in the first round. So you, you train for it all, the big night comes, you make your entrance, and then you just, yeah. Well, it, it's quite, it can be quite frustrating. I mean, in one, in one sense, this is the first round, but then in another, technically, it's the second round. Gerard's been rather kind, perhaps. Uh, he wants to get some... Uh, boxing under his belt and uh, entertain the crowd as well but uh, if it must feel and understandably why that against a 62 year old man uh, he ain't got nothing to fear within the ropes and then does a uh, coup de two coup de gras in the next round on the chess yeah, and you know, as you say um you chess box yourself and um you know, even though john might be advancing years it's a chance for him to show what's good technique um, and certainly I recall you know, seeing you fight Dimar Gasserian uh, a few years ago. Really, it was very impressive, the, the technical exhibition. I just remember I was ringside and just seeing the difference that your foot movement in particular was making. Just the, just the, the kind of shuffle back and forth and keep you out of range. Uh, well, having all that experience for the years, you know, it, 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 uh, it pays dividends, but uh, you won't even be expecting it from these two particular guys. Uh, for, for, for obvious reasons. <laughs> but, yeah, but John certainly coming out swinging as he knows he has to. Jared just uh, flicking the jab. Uh, a southpaw. How many southpaws did you fight in the career? Did you find that uh, difficult? Well, a few dozen, I guess, but it was never particularly a, a problem for me. But 
it seems Gerard's got the upper hand in the boxing as well as the chess. So uh, it is an uphill battle for uh, uh, John. And uh, yes, he, he needs a couple of them bricks in there, I think, to, to, to help him out. Because that's the only chance he's got of winning. Yeah, a, a brick in the right hand might help with the uh, with the care. But John is certainly is impressive with his movement and his work rate, considering the age differential. Oh no! In that sense, isn't it? there's nothing but respect for him to actually get in the ring, and uh, what, what he's doing for a 62-year-old man is it, quite good. And arguably, his technique is better than the, uh, what we see in the uh, the previous fight of both of the heavyweights put together. I, I don't mean that in a disparaging way to the the uh, previous uh, performers, but more to as a compliment oh, to him. Oh, John Down is looking all this slip. Oh, it's been way. No. <laughs> thought for a minute he was waving. Uh, there wasn't a count, so I, or a standing count, so I guess it was classed as a slip. Yeah, it certainly looked like that to me. I think John was just a little bit off but, balance yeah, there. Yeah, he's not up to it uh, from the boxing point of view, and uh, as we see in the, the, the chess, I don't think he's up to it in, in the chess either. So uh, this uh, would be known in, in the conventional sense as a, as a mismatch, and. Uh, I think we're relying on the sort of the, uh, the mercy and the, uh, the good contact of Gerard, uh, who's not, not taking advantage of it absolute. in a gentlemanly, sporting way. Yeah, absolute kudos to both there. And you know, John, you can see he's, he's really gassing after that one. That was a, a tough round for him. Um, and now I think he's going to come back to face his fate on the board. Uh, then, uh, Terry, you won your one and only chess boxing. Uh, match, were you more pleased with the boxing or the chess aspect of it? Is, I mean, it was a great performance on both both counts. Uh, I, I wanted to win the the, uh, the competition on the chessboard, in fact, but uh, it worked out that uh, there was a draw in the chessboard, so it went to points on the, on the boxing. So uh, I, I won it on the on the boxing, but I would have taken more pleasure to have won it on on the chess as such. Yeah. yeah um, I mean, obviously, I guess, given what you've achieved in the ring, then absolutely. Um, speaking with some of the other chess boxers on the circuit, I think they're really quite mixed as to how they prefer to win. Uh, I, I think, generally, the boxers would like to win in the ring, and the, the uh, sorry, the boxers would like to win on the chess board, and the chess players would like to win on, on, in, in the ring. Yeah. yeah, it's about, I guess, kind of showing the mastery of the one that you're that, that's less right. known for. Of I course, think. yeah, it's all right, yeah. yeah. Did, did you kind of enjoy the feeling of being back playing competitive chess as, as we were talking about? You'd be. Uh, uh, I, I enjoyed it until such times as I got in and uh, Dima caught me with a, a couple of a good, well, more than a couple of good shots. And uh, I think the phrase is beep this for a game of soldiers is what <laughs> I was actually thinking to myself, thinking that I should have sort of not cut, come in and uh, it's a young man's sport as opposed to an old man's sport. And I think that's probably what's going through the, uh, the mind of John as, as he's a. Uh, putting on his earphones as we speak and we are back to the chest it looks like there is impending checkmate and Gerard is now about to execute it the king has only one move here and then, which is forward and then the Queen's pawn comes down and that's it yeah. that is it Gerard Riley has driven the king to the center yeah. it's checkmate Yeah, checkmate the uh, chess equivalent of a KO, not something that you always see. Uh, well, fortunately, uh, I, I would have uh, suffered of quite a few KOs uh, in chess then. Before. <laughs> but uh, I, I managed to sort of handle that where okay, I would have been. So you may be confused about what just happened. Uh, we have a concession, I believe. Oh, no, it's checkmate. Okay. Winner by checkmate. Okay, here we go. His first time in the ring. This is awesome. Jared Ripper Riley wins by checkmate. That happened so quick, I even missed it. Give it up for both our chess boxes, John the Great Woods and Jared Ripper Riley. What about, what about? Just goes to show experiences and everything. Um, so we are going to take a very, very short break just to reset the ring and we'll be back shortly with some really fun interviews. So stay tuned. See you in a set. Give it up one more time for our amazing chess boxers. Yes!
Windsor Actuarial Consultants, supporting London chess boxing. Just chat to the people at home. How did that feel your first time? Yeah, it was good. Uh, John's a very experienced boxer, so um, I knew uh, I'd a lot. Uh, he's got his age, but um, I think he's been boxing for as long as I've been born. So, uh, and all those bricks must help, right, with his arms. I got across. I felt like there was brick in that, so uh, I think we might need a ref for that. But uh, yeah, I treated John with a lot of respect in training, and John's great. He took this fight in three weeks' notice, so what an absolute legend. Yeah, what a ledge. And uh, have you enjoyed the crowd tonight and being in the ring? The, the, coming out was the scariest part, uh, putting the hat on and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so you never know how the crowd's going to go. So You looked amazing. Oh. Is that what you wear all the time? That's, that's what I wear when I teach you. When you're, when you're at, you, you are literally the coolest geography teacher I've ever met in my life. Hopefully the students never see this like so. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Much. Well, thanks very much for being here. You're amazing. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. We'll see you in a bit. Thanks. Well, I, I, I believe I'm back now, uh, replacing Chris, the General Levy, but I'm still joined by Terry Marsh. How are you doing, Terry? Uh, well, disappointed for uh, John in the last fight. Uh, he, he made such a great ring entrance. <laughs> uh, I, I must say, it was rather odd in, in more than one sense, but uh, it's just a shame that uh, he wasn't up to it. But that's why, arguably, people in their 60s shouldn't do this, <laughs> which is the reason why uh, I'm now on this side of the mic as opposed to in the ring. So, sorry, so you, you think it was John's John's chess playing or John's chess boxing that, that showed that people in their 60s shouldn't do it? Because from where I was sitting, the boxing looked all right, didn't it? Uh, no, I, I don't <laughs> think, in, in all honesty, you know, it, it was going to work for 10 seconds, but then uh, the heart started beating quite hard. The lungs started sort of uh, struggling and uh, that's what happens when you get old. But when you're younger, you can recover. and but, there's no recovery when you get uh, once you get old. So uh, I think it was a mistake. But uh, the, his, his ring entrance was entertaining. Yeah, I mean it's very rare that one sees anyone enter a building carrying a hob full of bricks, let alone a sporting venue. And you spoke about the heart beating. When I was a chess player, when I saw F3 being played, I, I think I almost had a heart attack. That's an absolutely calamitous move to play so early in the opening. And actually, for for anyone watching at home looking to improve their chess. F3 is the reason why White lost that game, because the bishop took the pawn, White's dark squares were irrevocably destroyed, and he ended up with his king unceremoniously checkmated on E3, which is pretty calamitous losing a game with White after 11 moves. It, it, it suggests that there's not a sort of a, a, a grounding at chess uh, from early days. It, 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 I don't think you can ever, sort of, he's 62, I don't think you can have been playing chess for most of them, 62 years. Yes. Uh, because it is a basic fundamental error. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, and speaking of which, uh, we, were, we were chatting uh, with Tim earlier about the fact that you used to play an awful lot at school. What, what's your grounding in chess? How did you get into it? Uh, I, I played at school. Uh, I mean, I, I played when I was a, a youngster against my older brother. Uh, it was just a question of, uh, I'd done the moves, he told me whether it was legal or not. And then by the process of elimination, I learned how the moves were. And then I managed to put the the pieces together and then uh, I, I played at school we had a very enthusiastic uh, chess teacher and uh, we uh, it was a very good strong school we played in the national finals uh, I won an East London and London schoolboy title and it, wow. it more or less went, went, went from there but uh, I then put most of my efforts into boxing but the uh, my family my, my, a competitive younger brother uh, we used to play on a regular basis so I've got a son 
uh, who's uh, funny enough is an actuarial one that is uh, we've, been, <laughs> we've, we've been sponsored by actuarials uh, you know he, he plays the chess and so uh, it's a very competitive environment with chess that we still play and uh, but the uh, thing about it is uh, it is about chess and chess boxes it's risk assessment Absolutely. in very many ways Enjoying yourselves? Yeah, return crowd, you having a good time? Oh yeah, so am I. So we are moving into our third bout. Uh, this is gonna be a good one. I can feel it already. Our next chess boxer who's gonna be joining us used to be an accountant. But now he spends his days teaching chess to little children. Oh, I know, what a nice guy. I think he's gonna be great. Uh, <laughs> uh, his specialism apparently is death and taxes though, so I wouldn't write him off yet. So, joining us in the white corner, weighing in at 77 kilograms, standing at 190 centimeters, make some noise for Daniel, the tax man Mayfield! Yeah, here he comes! <laughs> Here's the tax man! and Mai Tai, he's an eclectic guy. And joining him in the ring, our next fighter says he is a polygot. Yeah, a polygot. Anyone know what that means? No. Means he knows a lot of languages, seven to be exact. That's right. He was apparently a child prodigy. Ooh, very fancy. He completed a university diploma in piano when he was just 15 years old. I mean, I'm expecting this guy to be very impressive after that. Uh, uh, last time out, he fell foul of the arms of our very famous chess boxer, Matt Crazy Arms Reed. So we're not sure what he's gonna do tonight, but he's very keen to get this first win under his belt. Uh, I'm told this, this chess boxer has a lot of extra skills. I mean, we are gonna witness something very special very, very soon. I can't tell you what it is. I wish I could mime it. Am I allowed to mime? I'm not allowed to mime it. You're gonna see something really, really cool, really, really soon. I'm feeling excited, <laughs> are you? I, I really am, I really am. Uh, <laughs> so let's tell you some stuff about this chess box. Oh, his hobbies, apart from piano, genius, his hobbies also include badminton and more piano. He really bloody likes piano. Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Are we ready to bring him out? We are starting to be ready to bring him out. I'm really glad. Uh, in the black corner, here we go, here we go, here we go. <clears throat> in the black corner, weighing in at 72 kilograms, standing at 177 centimeters. I think we are ready to welcome Brian No Slack Mac! <laughs>
worth the wait. Come on down, right hand, make some noise. Here he comes, elbow tagging the crowd. Air fist bumping, we can't be too careful these days. I've been reliably told he hand sanitized that entire saxophone before he entered the stage. Okay, make some more noise for Brian No Slap Man! And the saxophone. This belt was going to be amazing. I am psyched. I hope you are. Give it up one more time for our chess boxes. We have Daniel Taxman Mayfield and Brian No Slap Man. Have fun. So we're about, to, we're about to get started again. Hopefully less of a damp squib than the previous game where we saw White being checkmated in just 11 moves. Both Dan Mayfield and Brian No Slack Mac, pretty experienced players. I think we'll see a contest here. And we're back! Dan the Taxman Mayfield playing the English opening. Nice and patriotic start. Uh, Brian Mack getting his pieces into the center, looking to exert some control. Now he's threatening to play d5, which Brian has allowed. Okay, so Black seizing the center early on. I already quite like this for White, for Black, sorry. Normally White will play d4 to stop d5, threatening to take on e5, but actually Black already has a really, really nice position. He's got his bishop and his knight pointing into the center. He's got that really solid pawn on d5, a pawn on e5, a pawn on c6, supporting it all. Oh, Dan Mayfield looks like, oh. He looks, he looks simply sick with worry at what's going on here. Just, just awful, and uh, oh, you can see the terror, the terror in his eyes at that big pawn center, which Brian Mack <laughs> promises to send steamrolling down the board, using every inch of his athleticism to get that pawn storm going. So, Terry, what do you think of the opening so far? Well, Dan seems to be uh, having sort of, it appears to be sort of having difficulties. Uh, he's, he can't quite make his mind what he's trying to do, and he's just moved his bishop there, but. Um, Everything's in the game at the moment, and uh, they both seem to have the same uh, degree of uh, timings. So uh, when, it, when it comes to referring to the clock, it might not be too much of an issue at the moment. Or it might become an issue. So bishop to g5, a really, really good move, exerting pressure on d5 by way of creating a pin. A nice attritional start here. Brian Mack leaning into his hand there, supporting his heavy head, heavy with thought, heavy with intellect. That's a very quick castling manoeuvre. He's playing very confident chess here. I think Dan Mayfield has got the worst out of this opening here. But as Terry said, there's still loads and loads to play for. With the boxing coming up, what are you looking to do? What are you looking to do early on? Well, it's, well you're talking about Dan now, or, or Brian. I really don't know uh, from the boxing stage at the moment. Uh, one of them will feel that they are the sort of uh, the, the lesser chess player and maybe want to take advantage of that or to try and take advantage of the boxing. Uh, but it's a very difficult situation to make an, any assessment at the present moment. It's pretty level uh, with regards to the positions, in my view, but uh, 
from the timing point of view now, it seems that Brian's getting the, the upper end. I think Brian's actually seizing quite a serious initiative in the chess as well. If you consider that enormous central position, he's got those two bishops controlling the pawns on e5 and d5. Those pawns are controlling the f4 square, the e4 square, the d pawn, the, the c4 square as well. But still, nothing has been taken. It's a solid start, but one where black already has a bit of an advantage, and that's the bell, and we're going to see some boxing. Well, the boxing part... I think, I, I think Black has quite a serious advantage here. It's a, it's a, it's a, a bit of a funny one because nothing's, nothing's been taken. But posi positionally, it's a really, really useful edge. White played that weird move, Bishop G5, and then back to C1 rather unnecessarily as well, which suggested that he's been rocked a little bit. He's not entirely sure what plan he should be going for, whereas Black has played a series of very sensible moves, getting his pieces into the centre. And I think what White will end up finding is that he lacks a plan, that he's trying to move his... his um, oh, God, let's see if I can do this. Uh, pawn to Queen Knight 4. Pawn to Queen Knight 4 is a decent idea for White, <laughs> gaining some time on the side of the board while um, Black plays in the centre. But I, I just think, I think Black's got a nice position here. And if I if I were Dan the Taxman Mayfield, I, I'd be wanting to come out the blocks in the boxing a bit. Well, I think this book may, he may be relying upon, uh, but we really won't know until we see the, uh, the abilities from the boxing <laughs> perspective. And then uh, the, the game plan will may change from, from one way or the other. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, here comes the moment of truth, and I'm sure that Terry will be blazingly honest in his assessment of both players' boxing abilities, and, and that proves to be hugely instructive. I'm very, very excited to see how this goes, because to my mind, these guys will be pretty even based on their experience, but we've got a, a world champion in our midst who can uh, shatter that illusion well, one way or another. None of them have got an age advantage uh, in the <laughs> last contest, so yeah. Two, two young, fairly athletic men. You'd hope that neither of them will, uh, will fall into the kind of yeah. wheezing and, uh, and, and falling apart at the seams trap that you said happened last time. Right, and, that, and, and that's the bell. Oh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an energetic start, but one that one has to feel Brian has not benefited from. Uh, well, by Brian's paid a visit to the canvas, we aren't quite sure whether the referees uh, give him a count or, or not, but, uh, yeah, it was the same band as the initial upper hand in the boxing, and uh, it is always the case, uh, you might have the upper hand in the boxing and not in the chess, and uh, it may well be that he can take advantage of it. And then going down again, uh, suggests that uh, uh, Brian hasn't got the punch resistance, and uh, if he goes down for a, a third time, then I think it leaves it very difficult for the referee not to stop the contest. Wow. I so, and uh, he's gone down twice in less than a minute, and we've got more than a minute for this next round. But also, I mean, was he was he going down under the strength of Daniel's punches, or was that bad balance that led to him falling to the I think it's called being punch shy. <laughs> and uh, it's still not having the true experience of actually done enough rounds and having the ring craft. And so you don't know how to respond to actually any punches when you do take them. And, and what's the... Um, is the height advantage significant here? Uh, well, he isn't using his height in, as an advantage as such. He just seems to be opening up and uh, he's actually taking account as well. And uh, it's sort of... Uh, I don't know what, what the referees are learning to go on. He, he isn't hurt. I think he's just more bemused and doesn't know how to actually respond to the attacks. And uh, instinctively, he's looking for the floor. I mean, he's now turned his back, which is a complete no-no in boxing. Uh, but they are relatively novice as boxers, but they're not boxers as such, they're chess boxers. <laughs> but he, he, he's, he's, his body language is suggesting that uh, he doesn't actually... Uh, He's not looking forward to the, the next round if we, we get that far. Well, can you? I, I mean, we'll certainly see another round. We'll get to the next round of chess because the, the chess is in a very kind of uh, slow moving positional, attritional position where I think that the tax man has a bit of a disadvantage. But it seems like his advantage in the boxing is so significant that that's yeah. probably where this is going to end. I, I, would, I would think so. I think that's a, a fair comment and a reasonable comment, and uh, uh, it's, it's going to be an accurate prediction. So it's it's difficult to see, given that no pieces have been taken, we have an English which has gone very badly for White, but badly in the sense that 
Black could look forward to a pleasant grind. I, I don't think that's going to be enough, given that Black has fallen to the deck three times already. And as Terry said, like his, his lack of experience is is really making such a big difference. Like I, I really wouldn't know what to do if, if I were playing Black here. There's not a way you can open up the position to a degree to actually prevent the box, the next boxing round. So uh, yes, I, I would say this one. Uh, he makes a sort of a, a drastic error, uh, but I can't see that because he's, it, the, the defence is pretty conventional, although it's uh, not as strong as his, his opponents. But uh, to, for his opponent to find an, a, a knockout, uh, sorry, a, a checkout, checkmate in that position, it's been very difficult. But here's another thing: he's going to be very fatigued, and there'll be a lot of mental fatigue as well as physical fatigue, and he won't be as sharp as what he'd normally be. We had a pawn capture, ladies and gentlemen. It's the second round. We finally had a pawn capture. The position is still very, very good for Black, but Black fell to the floor so frequently in the boxing. He really has to do something to open up this position because I think he might be in serious risk of being knocked out in the next round, Terry. Uh, I think, uh, well, I've done about a knockout, but a stoppage uh, at least. And uh, as I say, he is tired, so he, he is more likely to make mistakes because of that mental fatigue as well as the physical fatigue. So White needs to find what's called a pawn break, ladies and gentlemen, a pawn break in order to leave it open the position. I think the only one I can actually see that is remotely advantageous is for White to move his queen's pawn forward one. At the moment, that would fall foul of pawn to e4, which would leave that knight on f3 with nowhere to go. So even though the position is practically symmetrical, it's really, really hard for White to find a plan here. But actually, he might not need one. Oh, pawn to d4, he's threatening to take the knight he's threatening to take the knight on c3 that could be a serious game changer given how badly black is doing in the boxing but will white stop it he has oh oh dear it's a retreat it's a slightly limp retreat by dan the tax man may feel the knight going back to its starting square in the same way that the dark square bishop did but moments ago black has a very very significant position advantage but given that the pawns are practically symmetrical it's difficult to see this changing anytime soon the queen falls to the deck much like no slack did so many times in the previous round but it is threatening to take the pawn on b2 the pawn on b2 okay he's swapping off rooks he's swapping off rooks much less exciting than i suggested ladies and gentlemen this is still a heroically boring position which means this is almost certainly going to be decided by the boxing So, Terry, what are your thoughts here? What are you doing? If you're, it's black to move, you've got a bit of an advantage, but the position is relatively locked. Do you have any sort of thoughts on how black can try and lever open the position here? Uh, I'm actually thinking from a, uh, from a point of view, I'm looking at the clock and it's running down. Mm -hmm. And uh, black has a big advantage on the clock. Uh, and so if you can make sort of a white, or Dan in this case, uh, you know, run, run down as much as it, he can and, and just goes to survive in, in the next round uh, of the, the, uh, the boxing, then uh, that might be uh, his best strategy. I, I, think that, I think that's absolutely spot on. I think that's absolutely spot on. The guy with the black pieces is doing so badly in the boxing that really his extra time is probably going to be the di big difference maker. But pawn to e4 was a really nice move. So White has captured the pawn. The bishop has captured it back. Now the bishop is going into c2. The bishop is coming into c2, which would be really tricky. But that is the bell. That is the bell. So Black has improved his position here. Bishop takes e4. If he moves his bishop too diagonally, then that queen can only move to c1. Uh, to, to yeah. To, to c1 and then the bishop can move back with devastating effect because it'll be attacked by the rook so we've got a round of boxing and and as you pointed out it wasn't perhaps of the highest caliber yeah. if you're both sides both sides perhaps a bit discombobulated for different reasons what are you looking to do in the early stages uh, in the early stage of the fight you just have to uh, from uh, black uh, death uh, Brian Mack yeah Brian Mack's point of view uh, he's uh, up against it uh, from Dan, Dan's point of view you know he's now in, in charge of his own destiny in, in these next uh, two minutes or so and uh, if the first round was anything to go by he's going to be more fatigued so he c it looks e even worse than what the previous round was going to be well from my amateur so, perspective part of the issue seems to be that Brian Mack is coming out quite so aggressively to start with uh, well 
he may start aggressive, but he doesn't finish aggressive. <laughs> so, yeah. So I think the, the the ref is going to be on standby here, really, really scrutinising this, uh, right? Just to check that Brian is is okay to continue. Because if he goes down again, you said that that might lead to it calling well, time. It's determining whether it, it, he's going down, sort of through, uh, sort of uh, being overwhelmed or actually being hit on, on the chin. And uh, most of the time, it's because he's overwhelmed. But <laughs> you can only give, like for example, there, that wasn't a knockdown. But you cannot, if you keep going down, you can't keep blaming the opponent for putting you down. There, there comes a time when the referee is going to lose patience and say, you know, uh, you know, enough is enough. You, you're not fighting back properly. It's, and, and in one way, it could be tactical, which is quite unsporting and against the idea of the chess boxing. So the, the referees might have to take a position on this. But we've only, uh, we've only got a minute to go, so it's very much, as you said, a, a task for survival here. Brian narrowly uh, avoiding going down to the turf once again. Yeah, it's, it's actually survival, but it's being survival and staying on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's what survival is, isn't it? And, you know, yeah. Staying upright, keeping going. But um, that is looking increasingly tricky in this round. So Dan Mayfield has 35 seconds left. He's, hit, he's hitting a few punches. What would you be doing if you were him, if you want to bring this round to an end? Uh, well, he's hitting punches, but to be perfectly honest, we're not very powerful punches, so we ain't going to see a literal knockout. Uh, obviously... Uh, Brian there, he's uh, showing fatigue and he's he's breathing heavy and he's he's bending over when the referee calls break and he's looking for, to get his, to recover. So physically, he's up against it. Uh, I think he may sort of uh, survive this round and uh, win it on the chest with regards to the timing. And he's going to win it on the clock, after, I suspect. Well, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if he's going to win it on the clock this round. Oh, sorry, Greg, so. lose it, lose it on the oh, clock. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, I bet you're right. I mean, he, Brian, no, Brian Matt White might well win this on time, but actually, um, Dan the Taxman Mayfield still has about two minutes left, which should be enough time to survive this round as long as he I doesn't see. just stop. Like, um, if Brian can, in, Brian has to instantly play. That's that's really his only viable strategy is to just blitz his opponent off the board. But that's really hard if you're feeling fatigued. Like, I've I played chess matches where I've been, you know, tired or not myself. He's literally just being hit, hit falling to the ground constantly. And that, that's not remotely the same thing. It's going to be really hard for him to find the mental strength to get that attitude right and well, try to force something here. Well, he's got to sit at the board and take everything in and, and, and make moves and uh, conscious of the clock, ever conscious of the clock, uh, and whether he's going to make the right decisions and the right moves. And uh, there's going to be lots of errors, I, I guess, in, in this particular round of chess. Oh, well, that's chess boxing for you. A catalogue of errors, but a phenomenally enjoyable one. I think this is going to be a really interesting round. Uh, Brian is the only person who can really generate anything from his position, but there's surely no way he's going to play with any kind of accuracy. So time is his main friend here. Play quickly, try to force a mistake, and let's see if he can do that. And we're back. We're back. So, Brian Mack with the black pieces, having fallen to the turf so many more times, really needs to make something of his additional clock time. And he's won a night! He's won a night for absolutely nothing. Bishop to C1, an absolute jaffer removed by the tax man. An absolute jaffer. And he's down to a minute and a half on the clock. He looks really, really weary here. Really weary. And it's all about survival. It's all about survival now. And Brian has to play quickly. He has to play quickly and find a way to use that extra time to his advantage. Because I don't know about you, Terry, but I don't think he's going to survive another round of boxing. Uh, I, I would think not, but, uh, you know, uh, at the moment, I, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I, I think it will go to the, the extra round. Yeah, I mean, uh, and Bishop... Bishop takes G2, an interesting idea. So now, White has what's called a discovered attack. So if he moved his knight, then the bishop would be attacking Black's queen, which could be a serious game changer. But then the knight could take E3, the bishop, with check. So a really, really clever move by Black. He's playing knight F5. He's playing knight F5. Now Black has to see knight takes E3. Knight takes E3 is a really, really useful move here. But I think, I think if he takes back with the pawn, then white, white is actually 
you know, coming back into this game a little bit. The Rook on E1 is not contributing anything at all, but he's a whole piece down. White is a whole piece down here, and his clock time is really serious. So Black has to play quickly. He's taken it. The knight taking back with the knight was not a good move, ladies and gentlemen. Not a good move at all. He's completely discombobulated. He's all over the shop. But it is surely, it is surely, with one minute and ten seconds left, going to be decided by the boxing. Decided by the boxing. That's, that's much better. Thank you. Thank you very much. So queen to d3, uh, uh, very much a sort of holding move here with not much time. Now Daniel is guaranteed to survive another round because there's only 48 seconds left and he has more than that time on the clock. He can't really afford... It's check! It's queen c6 check! It's a check, so the king has to move. The king moves back, and I just don't think Black, Black, although he's clearly winning this, I don't think he's got enough in the game to try and generate a winning attack in the next 30 seconds. So Dan has to play sensibly. If that bishop moves, if that bishop moves, then the queen is going to be attacked. The queen is going to be attacked, but that's an interesting idea. It's an interesting idea because the queen might be able to take that rook on d8 if the bishop moves. So. Terry, what, do, what should we be looking out for in the boxing now that this is surely, this is surely going to go to another round? Uh, well, if it goes into the next round, then the situation will be he will have to get a, a knockout and uh, he's going to have to be... Well, and that's the bell! And that's the bell! We're going back to the boxing. I won't have to make any predictions. You can see what happens. <laughs> I, I have a quite clear prediction to you. I think Brian goes down and the ref stops it yeah. this round. Well, it, 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 he, he's going down, but he ain't actually being hurt. He's, he's going down because he's tired, and uh, you can't criticise someone if they're tired and they go down, but it's uh, against the spirit uh, of the game, and uh, it depends on the patience of the referee. And uh, I, I think the, uh, the opponent if, will feel a little bit hard done by it that... Uh, the referee hasn't to stopped to stop the contest. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that Ronaldo is going to be primed for such a stoppage next round over for, for the reasons that you say. And actually, with the time difference, I mean, Dan, Dan didn't handle his clock particularly well. He really needed to be playing instantly, the, the, the guy with the white pieces. So if Brian can somehow survive this round, he will surely win. He will surely win the final round of chess. So it really is all or nothing here. That's My it. personal prediction, though, is that Brian no slack Mac is going to go to the turf and the ref is going to stop it one way or another? Uh, well, I, I agree with you. I, I'd expect that, but uh, I think uh, we are really, really discussing the behaviour of the referee and what how he's going to sort of make the interpretations and decide how, what decision he's going to draw. Well, we will see. We we will see in this final round of boxing. So. Dan Mayfield actually looks a little bit tired himself, doesn't he? I know he's taken fewer punches, but um, he's not he's not come on out of the uh, out of the starting blocks in the way that he like had needed to. That's right, in previous rounds, that's true. Exactly. And, and you can see him visi physically, sorry, visibly huffing there uh, uh, as well, like a, a very very clear intake of breath. Brian just standing there, taking some incredibly gentle punches to the face. Yeah, you see, it's just, from the boxing point of view, this seems to be Brian's best round. <laughs> In so much that he stayed on his feet for uh, 40 yeah. seconds. Yeah, yeah I, 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 a little, this is, this is what happens, I suppose. Like, I mean, both people, phen like, phenomenal chess boxes in the sense that this is such a difficult discipline if you're not super proficient at one or the other and both of them have given it a really really good go but it doesn't look like either of them got enough in the tank to win the boxing so what do you reckon last minute what are you doing yeah well it seems that way uh, this is his uh, best performance uh, he hasn't touched the, uh, the canvas at all and uh, it doesn't look like he's going to be touching the canvas uh, for the next 44 seconds yeah. well, I suppose so, Mm. Sorry, Terry, go on. Oh, no, it's, uh, it's basically, basically it. So it looks like it's going to go to the chessboard and uh, it's going to be a question of uh, winning on time or losing on time. Yeah, I mean, I think Brian, Brian's position is also much better. Oh. Yeah. Dan, Dan Mayfield looks they're, they're completely both, shattered. Yeah, they're, they're both happy to hold each other. <laughs> yeah, Which, so, yeah. you know, very, very rare in yeah. the current climate, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> uh, oh, oh, OK, oh. hello. Hello, a late flurry there. But Brian fought back uh, on that occasion. Yeah. 
If he hadn't, it might have been game over, I suppose. Uh, but it's quite possible and feasible that the referee might have thought that it's time to step in. But oh, there we go. Save. Don't know whether he's saved by the bell or not, but... Uh, uh, oops. My word, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's, um, it's a testament to Brian that he managed to survive that round. And, and to me, as the, uh, the amateur, it looked as if the fact that he didn't actually go out and try and hit Dan from the off went in, went, uh, in his favour because Dan just didn't have anything in the tank to make anything of that. No, that, that, that was prob probably the case. And uh, he needed the first half of the round to make the recovery so that he could uh, launch uh, some semblance of an attack. But, uh, I mean, I don't know whether he did actually go down or whether it was classed as a knockdown, but uh, <laughs> that, was his, that was his best round because he only went down once. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, we've got the final, final round of chess now, and it is very difficult to see anything other than a black victory. Black with a substantial time advantage, uh, an extra piece on the board. White looks just completely gone. A smile to the crowd, but it, it's surely it's a smile in the knowledge of inevitable defeat. White's got nothing here, nothing at all. And we're and back. 39 seconds to go. 39 seconds to survive. White is a whole piece for a pawn down, and Black is offering the trade off of Queens. White cannot, White cannot trade Queens, and he's avoided it. He's avoided it, but time is not on his side. What on earth is White going to do? He has to find a way to get his Queen in the game, to get his Knight in the game. But Brian, Brian is all over this. He is all over this. His position is completely impregnable. What on earth? What on earth can White hope to do here? White looks resigned. He's hovering over the board. A man who knows that death, death on the chessboard is calling. There is nothing, nothing on earth he can do here. Queen to C2. He's threatening to win the night. I mean, what else do you do, Terry? Yeah. I mean, I think this is it. I think this is it. I think, as you've been predicting the whole game with increasing acuity, I think this is ending on the clock. Knight, knight to g5, threatening knight h3. I mean, it doesn't do a huge amount, but anything, anything that makes White think is to his advantage because White has 10 seconds left. 10 seconds, and the round is nearly two minutes long. I mean, Dan has to have a flurry, a flurry of finger activity, which the boxing suggests he just doesn't have. He's completely shocked. He's threatening the queen, but... Brian could do anything here. He just needs to leave the game with his dignity intact. Queen to e5, a good move. We're down to seconds. We're down to literal seconds. Knight goes back to e3, and it's five seconds. Five seconds White has left. Brian, cool, cool as you like after that boxing flurry consistently sent into the turf, but he can enjoy this. He can revel in the knowledge of his inevitable victory. Three seconds, two seconds. Surely it's over. It's over. <laughs> Brian Mack wins! And Terry, you're absolutely spot on. It came down to the clock in the end. Oh, well. I've, ne I've never known someone to go down so many times and become a winner. Brian, join us. Let's announce this properly. Our winner by time penalty in the chess. Brian, no slack, man! are pounding in the boxing. How did you manage to keep your composure in that chest? Well, I've never... So, during training, obviously, we don't go at it like this. So, first time having an opponent really going for it. Yeah. So, I'm not more than used to it, but then... Zoe was very helpful, and so I just tried to dodge a bit more and then hug him in the third round. Um, I shouldn't fall down, really. It's not good. But uh, next time, we wouldn't. I mean, one of your skills is listed as extreme fitness, and you did manage to keep your composure when you sat back down. Uh, do, do you think fitness helps with that? Uh, definitely. Not at the top, but everyone's sick now as well, but it was good. And uh, how does everyone feel about the sax playing? <laughs> so give it up for both our chess boxes, the tax man and Brian No Slack Man. So we are going to take another quick bear break.
to reset, so please recharge your glasses. We'll see you back shortly. Thank you. So Terry, I, that was that was really really enjoyable. Thank you so much for joining us. That, that oh, was that I've was been, a real learning experience for me, and I'm sure people at home. I've, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. The ring entrances are unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. Thank you so much. Windsor Actuarial Consultants supporting London chess boxing. Absolutely glorious, and we're back. We're back. I, I mean, thank you so much to Terry Marsh. I, I enjoyed every second of that. And an icon, a true icon. It just um, a pleasure to sit next to him, um, and really, yeah, just to, to absorb the wisdom on the boxing there. Yeah, I mean, it, it just just a, a phenomenally uh, intelligent man. Obviously, like a world-class boxer and a true gent as well. So that was a that was a great experience. And a couple of slightly odd games for him to see, though. I mean. I think we have to face facts that John Wood had a little bit of a mare in that one. Being mated in 11 moves with White is not, you know, that's not normal, is it, Chris? No, I mean, I mean, it, he didn't start off in the best way, even the first few moves. I think that kind of formation he had, E4, F3, D3, followed by Bishop E2. Oh, oh no, I mean, it, was was, F, it was F3. It was F3 first. It was quite literally no, the, wor the worst move. Forgot. The worst move on the board because it, it's the only move in that position that basically makes White's position worse. In, in my head, he'd played e4 then f3, but regardless, it was no a, e4 then f3. It, but exactly, it, exactly. It, it, it was a a bizarre opening choice, and his uh, neglect of the black squares came back to haunt him. Uh, he compounded it by, you know, he, after the bishop check, he could have at least shoved his king in the corner and hunkered down a bit, but he chose uh, the slightly more perilous route. Uh, and was driven mercilessly to the middle of the board and mated, which, I mean, in the spirit of Terry, was what it deserved, that opening play. I, let's not pull any punches, so to speak. No, no, I, 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 I think it, it's, it, I mentioned at the time on the feed, it's a real learning experience for anyone who doesn't play regularly. If you leave that square open to attack, then it's very difficult to defend because the F2 and the F7 square are only defended uh, by the respective kings. Um, and of course, the king can't capture back if it's being attacked by two pieces. And, and essentially, uh, black forced the king into the center of the board, which, I mean, move 10, that's just, oh, no, I don't think, I, I think John Wood, John Wood has to learn from that, come back, come back stronger. Um, and just do, do his best to avoid that yeah. kind of calamity again. Yeah, I've, I've seen him play better games than that, so he's, he's got it in him. Um, I think it would be a little bit disappointed, perhaps, under the lights it didn't quite um, happen as he would have liked. And then the last match, yeah, that one went a little bit longer, um, and really we had the intriguing setup of one player really taking quite, quite the beating, a literal beating in the ring, uh, but managing to hold it together on the board there and I mean a win by time but he was uh, clearly in the avantageous position. Yeah I mean actually Bri Brian Mack played a superb opening. I mean White, White wasn't familiar with the um, the classic idea in the English where with a pawn on e5 if black plays c6 then White has to play d4 to prevent black from getting such a strong center. He didn't do that. Black basically got a perfect position which was improved by the fact that White played bishop to g5 and then back to c1 again uh, and then funnily enough it was this move bishop d2 back to c1 that led to white making your, your classic Jaffa Chris blundering the knight on b1 uh, and, and actually that kind of lost it for white because white didn't have the pieces at the end to make anything from his already ropey position which put the pressure on the boxing and then astonishingly despite Brian Mack looking so tired for all of it actually Brian's 
fatigue was the better in the final round and that's how he was able to survive long enough to win at the chess. Yeah, I mean, really impressive. Even though he had the advantage to um, to hold it together after, you know, what were some quite brutal rounds of boxing there. It's, it's one thing to convert a clearly winning position over the board in the best of circumstances, but to be doing it once you've kind of taken that many blows and you're clearly going to have the adrenaline flowing around was quite impressive. And I think you're... Yes, you're, you're right to call out the very strong opening play from Brian there. So if Johns was really suboptimal um, and maybe didn't do him justice as a player, Brian, I think, is... Um, yeah, that was very impressive. He, he demonstrated a good understanding of the particular opening um, and the central control paid off in terms of forcing the mistake. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we, we can't... <laughs> Brian Mack is not a very experienced chess player, but he played some, a seriously classy game today, like really, really impressive. Of course, imperfect, but I mean, David Jarmany, who is who's a much better chess player than I did, um, you know, his his game, he played a good game, but actually I think Brian Brian's has been the standout chess game so far. No, a, a real improver, and yeah, not that, not that impressed, but I've seen him, also not experienced, but I have seen him in multiple tournaments and playing in the London League. He is, he's really thrown himself in to the chess with the dedication uh, that you would expect of a man who has taught himself seven languages, um, treated us to Jerry Rafferty there live, um, is a piano genius. He is a true polymath, and I think he is assimilating chess at a much quicker pace than, um, than most people would, and I really hope to see him back again in a few months and see how much he's progressed in the interim because if he keeps up this rate yeah he could get to a very high level yeah i i think so i i think so he's got a very solid foundation to build on and and actually kind of kind of rare for someone who's relatively new to chess it looks to, to, to me, the amateur is actually his boxing is the area to work on because had Daniel had that little bit more stamina and been able to hit, land a few heavy punches at the end, then I suspect Brian would have gone down. I mean, that was that was the prediction that Terry and I, well, I'm going to say Terry and I, the one I sort of shouted through. I was so sure, so sure to my amateur eyes that Brian would go down there. And I, I think it's it was a fascinating tie and I think absolutely a, a testament to this sport. Yeah, I mean, sorry, just just a bit of a shout out to the people who have made it to Tufnell Park today. We, we've got some wonderful signs in in the crowd. Uh, we have one actually that is um, that is advertising the uh, the next fighter, which is uh, Cheyenne, uh, the Kingstonian uh, Dolab. Um, this is his second fight, and he's facing uh, Ronan. Ronan, 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 Koja, Roger, the Cannonball Baxter, a man who both both of us know very well. I mean, these are two quite flamboyant individuals who enjoy soaking up the atmosphere. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to both entrances. Shyan, I heard, has a coterie with him. He won't be making an entrance solo. That is all I can say. Uh, they're both enthusiastic fighters um, as well. Now, now Cheyenne, you know, he enjoys his martial arts and his training. Roger, ab Roger absolutely loves the boxing. Um, and I think we're just seconds away as our host, Jem Carmella, is in the ring. So I think we prepared to hand over to her. But I'm looking forward to our final yet title by bout. This should be the, uh, the highlight of the evening. Bow. Oh no, this is a title fight as you can see by this beautiful belt. This final bout will decide the WCBA British Middleweight title. Oh, it's exciting times, it's exciting times. So, first 
up in the ring, we have got a show pony for you. He calls himself the King of Persia. Yeah, he says, all kneel before his Anglo-Iranian monarch. I mean, yeah, b b be excited. It's gonna be good. Uh, he's a professional landlord by trade. And if he doesn't own you now, he says, he will soon. Oh, he's made himself some enemies there, hasn't he? <laughs> he says, although he doesn't enjoy putting up your rent, he does enjoy the finer things in life that that affords him. Oh! But he does have a bit of a show for you. So, let's bring him in. In the white corner, weighing 75 kilograms, standing at 170 centimeters, make some noise for Cheyenne the Kingstonian Zarin Dollar! prowess <laughs> and next up in the ring for this title fight born in Sheffield yeah be in love for Sheffield come on uh, we have a chess boxer whose Irish heritage will be denoted by his awesome hair his hair knows no boundaries it's so luscious and gorgeous and red. You are going to be blinded by its beauty. <laughs> this ginger bomber wrote his PhD on how crime was changed by the advent of the railway. Not only is he the luscious redhead, he's also brainy. Let's make some noise for our black corner fighter in the black corner weighing 75 kilograms. Make some noise for Roger Cannonball Baxter! Let's 
let's make some more noise for both your British middleweight title contenders. Cheyenne the Kingstonian Zadib Dolab and Roger Cannibal Baxter. Enjoy this bout. See you in a bit. <laughs> and we're back. God, this is going to be... I think we are. I think we're back. Uh, I mean, I think this is going to be an absolutely cracking fight, Chris. Um, very much looking forward to this one. I mean, two superb entrances there, I have to say. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. I mean, I love Roger's cape so much. It, it really brought back to mind um, memories of watching WWE and Gregory the Hurricane Helms, as mentioned uh, to you of, of, of Mike, a singularly bad wrestler, uh, and uh, someone who I think Roger is going to thoroughly usurp uh, with his performance right now. Oh, well, Cheyenne's entrance as well. I mean, I've, I have never seen its like at the Dome. Uh, no, no, not, not at all. It, um, Certainly was a lovely hat, and he sports, uh, you know, an excellent beard for all you, uh, you know, all, all you uh, beard lovers out there. That is quite a sporting piece of facial hair. Oh, I mean, and, and the hair, he's I mean, really gone all in this one. They're two strong chess players. I'm looking forward to see if they can produce a spectacular chess as their entrance to the ring. Oh, absolutely, like Cheyenne's, Cheyenne's performance in his debut fight shows that he's a force to be reckoned with both in the ring and over the ball. For him to earn a title fight so quickly is a testament to that. Whereas Roger is quite experienced that both came from no boxing background but has put so much effort into this. He's a proper chess player. He's someone who I played on the junior circuit. And uh, with his gorgeous red hair and his luscious cape, I think a firm favorite for this man. And we are off. Matt, what an entrance. Can the chest deliver the promise of those two spectacular entrances? Well, it's a gloriously attritional start by Roger the Cannonball Baxter with the Arkel Genkin variation of the Karo Khan defense. Uh, I'm sure that so. Old chestnut, that Matt. old chestnut, the old Arkel Jenkin. The number of times I've said that sentence, ladies and gentlemen, goes beyond belief. So, an interesting start. C3, a small positional error by White. White would like to play Knight to F3 in this position, but that would actually be a bad move here, because if he, are, if he were to do it, then Black can play his bishop to G4, getting a uh, variation of the exchange French, a tempo down, but with the bishop outside the pawn chain. Bishop B5 is a great move, a really good move. Knight F3, a positional mistake. Bishop e5, the only way to make it work. Now, Cheyenne's having a think. Is he worried that if he takes, Queen a5 check will come? Ostensibly winning the bishop, but actually there's a way out of that, Chris. Yeah, so the, this is some quite canny play here. They're playing around with different kind of transpositions to different openings here. Heads up, Chris! A piece has been taken! Oh, a knight for a bishop. It's, it's a level trade. And now Roger can already try and get the R. I don't like E6. E6 feels a little bit disadvantageous. You probably want to get the bishop outside that pawn chain first. But what a lovely neck crick by Roger. This is a man who is not, not going to be taunted. This is a man who knows what he wants and is going to get what he wants. I think he's, I guess he's going to play bishop A6 is his plan. So he wants his bishop on that diagonal from A6 to F1. And we have a check. We have a check. Bishop B4. Check. Now white, white light squares are, as Chris said, looking decidedly weak, decidedly weak, but Roger has to defend his bishop first. I think defense is probably the best form of attack here. Ah, he swapped it off, he swapped it off. We've got another piece off the board, ladies and gentlemen, but Chris, I think that was a little bit of a mistake. Yeah, so he could just have defended it rather than uh, swapping off the two bishops. I mean, it's certainly not a game-ending mistake or anything like it. It's just a slight positional mistake. Uh, knight, knight to e7, another opportunity missed. So bishop a6 would have been a really, really nice idea there. Stopping white from castling because, ladies and gentlemen, you can't castle through check. So if that bishop had gone two squares diagonally, the king couldn't have moved, and then black could have coordinated his pieces to attack it. But he's missed that opportunity. Yeah. White has played a clever, a clever move there. And for the uninitiated, that's what we mean by castling the move that they both played to send. 
Uh, so it's the only move where you can move two pieces at the same time. The king gets tucked into the corner, the rook goes the other side of it. So actually, previously, the most important parts of the position were that white had weak light squares and that the d pawn was a target. Now, the tables have turned, and I think white's a little bit better because white has that weak c6 pawn to look at and the d4 pawn isn't so weak anymore, but that's the bell. Some very canny opening play there. I was worried for a, a period that Shine was going to get caught in that transposition that you mentioned. However, you know, Roger missed a couple of opportunities as you highlighted. Bishop, if, if you're not going to play Bishop F5, you have to play Bishop A6 there um, and keep the king in the centre. And once he hasn't played that, he's now going to be a little bit hewn to the defence of that C6 pawn, which they can wreak and has the rook bearing down on it. Yeah, I, I think. Roger really needed to take a little bit of time there. They, they have a lot of time in the clock. They've got nine minutes each. And I think he was very he was very quick to... I think Bishop B4 was an OK idea, but maybe less of a priority than Bishop A6. I don't know. I think Bishop B4 is a decent move. Um, Bishop takes D2, kind of removing the tension in a position we had a real opportunity to seize an advantage. Uh, that was a mistake that I think he's going to struggle to come back from. I think had he played Bishop A6, then White would have had a really, really nice hey, position. Hey, hey, hey. As it is, sorry, Black would have had a really nice position. As it is, White has a small advantage, and the chess is comparatively level, but Black has really missed an opportunity to, um, to turn the screws and to make White's life very difficult. And it looks like we're just about to go into the box, and these are two all-action fighters, and I'm looking forward to seeing how they match up in the ring. Uh, Roger looking in the trimmest shape I've ever seen him, I have to say. Um, the, the physical transformation the man has made since he first stepped into Insulin Amateur Boxing Club is testimony to his work effort and Shane, a real fitness fanatic as well. Yeah, I think, I, I think that these, these guys are going to be matching the fitness levels of the first fight, which boxing-wise was, was definitely the highlight. So I think the chess is going to be very interesting, potentially a little bit attritional. Black trying to play for C5, White trying to prevent that whilst exerting pressure on C6. I think the boxing is really anyone's guess. Maybe Roger a slight favourite, but we will see. Let's, let's, let's see how they start out. As, as we've seen most fights, they are you're feeling each other out in the initial... So just Roger taking the centre of the ring there. Um, Shane Ryan is moving in a few early flurries because he's having a bit of trouble closing the distance. But, but a good right there. Snuck a good right in past Roger's guard. Like, this, this feels to me like it, it's quite an aggressive start, but, uh, but controlled aggression both sides are. Their balance is good, there's no flailing about. These guys know what they're doing, and I don't think Shane's been boxing all that long, so that's pretty good work. That's, it's very impressive, both in, in, Roger, if you take a look, he's doing well at saying side on, which is where you want to be. A lot of fighters this evening, picking the last fight, have tended to square up. It has two disadvantages, it shortens uh, your punch length, but it also makes you a bigger target, simply because you're presenting all. So if you look at Roger, he's doing quite a good job there, of saying side on, leading with his, uh, you know, with his, his lead shoulder, and just showing a little bit less there. Roger, of course, sporting a gloriously uh, indoor pair of shorts. Green, green as the St. Paddy's Day hat. And I, oh, I'm, I'm very, this has been a very impressive start by both players. This, this was the makings of a really high oh, quality fight. Yeah, that's the quality jab there from Roger. You know, he, it's a good heavy jab that he puts some, some effort into it. It landed well in Rockshire's head back. Oh, that, that's got to hurt. Yeah, this is this is quality stuff. I think no one's getting the other one out of there anytime soon, but it's it's, it's good back and forth. And I think Rogers asserted himself quite well in this first round of boxing. But Shine not not shying away, you could say, from returning fire with his right hand. Well, I mean, you've got a true way with words, Christopher. That is that is just that is just ace. Well, I mean, we have to thank Terry for stepping in there and giving me frankly the the breathing space to come up with that one i would like to claim i'd come up with that off the cuff but there was a lot of preparation almost as much that went into the uh transposition attempt there Whoa. i will cut off from talking about the chest because it's warming up again in the ring yeah, Roger oh. did take a bit of oh no that's a real flurry that is such a flurry of activity roger in big trouble but he is 
Oh my goodness, oh my goodness me, he did well to survive that. It, that was seriously challenging. It, it started with a big right that Cheyenne ended. You could see it had a visible effect and then he followed it up uh, with a, a sort of two, three combo there. And another right there. Oh, another dear, right dear, lands dear. to Rogers. He, he is going to be saved by the bell very shortly. He's skipping out the way. Three minutes, a long oh, time. Oh, the big oh, right again. It keeps happening, Roger really needs to survive this. The, the battle must be coming. A, a couple of seconds late there, I think, with the bell, but thankfully nothing landed. But that really exploded into life in the last, the last 30 seconds of the round. I thought Roger was doing very well while it was controlled. Yeah, yeah, Roger, they yeah, good orthodox technique. Oh, yeah, working with the jab and saying side on, and then suddenly mirror, mirror. Uh, rocked by the big right hand from Shine, which he then followed up really, really pouring it on. Not once, but twice. There was a, a brief respite, and then he came again at the end of the round. And really, we have to see now how this is going to affect Roger in the ball. Can he adjust? Yeah, and I, I think I think this is going to be a challenging one for Roger because actually White's play is relatively straightforward here. You probably play something like Knight B3, stopping the uh, the C pawn from advancing, and, and then just maneuver. And, and actually. Roger's bishop on, on a6, assuming that's where it goes, is not doing a whole lot anymore. Uh, it's just kind of like biting on air, uh, as it were. You move the rook to e1, and then you just play around it. So yeah. I think I think White's advantage in the chess is less significant than it perhaps ended up in the in, in the boxing. But it, it's not to be understated. Like Roger's missed opportunity with the black pieces, not playing bishop a6 before castling, uh, not defending the bishop on b4. Um, I think that's going to come back to haunt him. And we're back. Matt, what a round of boxing. Reminds us of the situation that we have in the chess. So, Roger had a wonderful opportunity to seize a positional advantage, but now, but now White is perhaps taking control of this. So, Queen B6, a good move. Our eyeing up that weak B2 square. He that pawn is going to be taken next move, but I think I think Cheyenne can stop that. If he moves his knight to b3, controlling the c5, oh, he's and he's done it. it! What a nice idea. So that knight is stopping the b2 pawn from being captured, and Roger's main idea is to move the pawn in front of the bishop forward one square, but it's being controlled by the pawn on d4, the rook on c1, and the knight on b3, so he's trying to move that knight away, and a5 is a very classy move. But why does Roger want to move that ball? What's, what's so special about that pawn? Why is it the key to the position at the moment, man? Well, I think he needs to move that pawn forward in order to open up some space, in order to change the nature of the position. Because if nothing happens here, if nothing happens, it's a bit easier for White to manoeuvre. So, Queen to C2, a good move, a good move. Now, Knight to G5. Knight to G5 is an idea. And that would threaten checkmate, Chris. White, White might be craftily trying to bring the chess to an end really quickly. So what I like here is that it looks like the play is on the queen side. It looks like he's playing against that weak pawn he mentioned. But actually, he might be lining up that kingside attack, like you said. So the knight is attacked. The knight is attacked. He can either move the knight onto that nice c5 outpost, diagonally opposite from the queen, or he can play a crafty move and play knight g5, threatening checkmate. OK, he's played knight c5. He's playing knight c5. It's calm. It's collected. It stops the bishop from moving, because if the bishop moves, then knight to d7 oh, yes. would win a rook, would win a rook. So a3, a good move. Roger is threatening to take the pawn on b2. This game is phenomenally exciting phenomenally exciting very classy these guys are a true testament to the sport Chris oh it, it's been the highest quality chess of the night without a doubt and what's really impressed me is Shine's control of the position here he's not rushing it he knows he's got a slight positional edge and he's just keeping Roger bottled up for now but all it takes is one slip and then Roger can turn the tables. I think this is a very difficult position for Black to play here. So h6 is a useful move because it stops that idea, threatening checkmate, but Black is really close to running out of decent moves. I think Cheyenne can just keep building up some play, just play sensibly, keep an eye on the clock. So h3 doesn't do a lot, but it puts the question to Roger, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? So rook a7 is a nice idea. It stops the knight coming into d7. So now the bishop can move. A really, really useful game by both sides. And I, I'm, I'll tell you what, Chris, I'm super impressed. It's, it's very smart maneuvering at the moment. And Roger is, as you pinpointed, trying to iron out the weakness he has in his position, which is that bishop that is locked behind its own pawns. Now he's got it out. And what he's doing is he's inviting a trade. 
he wants Shang to swap the knight for that bishop. So you need to be looking at the quality of individual pieces, ladies and gentlemen. So that bishop on a6 looks good because it's arrowing down the board, but really it's doing nothing. White can just ignore it, can just play around it. And that knight on c5 is so good. It would take three moves for White's black for Black's knight to attack it. So you can just leave it there. It's such a thorn in the position. So much so that White has time to throw his pawns up the board to put the question to the Black King. And I think, I think White is going to be creating some pretty tasty threats soon. Yeah, he's now, he's, he's kind of locked the queen side in the center down to stop the counter attack. And now he's starting to brew it on the king side. So black wants to play knight to g6 so that he can take advantage of the weakness of the f4 square. The only issue with that is that c6 would be a bit weaker. And that is the bell. What a game. What a game we're having here. That was a quality round. I, re I really like knight c2, or queen c2 from China because it, it looks like he's just kind of playing against that c pawn, but he subtly introduces the threat on the king side, which is quite hard, hard as black to see when you've been focused so much on the bishop and the c6 pawn, which is the weakness that you're trying to iron out. So I 100% I, I agree with you. I think white has played a, a very, very good game so far. It is slightly, um, a slightly bad opening that black didn't make the most of. Got a bit of an advantage. And, and yeah, with the boxing coming up, I think, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I think both both fighters looked a little bit unsteady, but but do, what do you think, Cheyenne's flurry of activity at the end, kind of the key the key factor? I mean, Roger con controlled it reasonably well for three quarters of the round, um, and then Cheyenne just detonated a, a bomb of a right hand on Roger's chin, and he really poured it on after that. And then there's a point at which he thought it could potentially... Uh, you know, be a stoppage almost, but... And uh, we're, we're back, we're back with the yeah. so. Let, let's, let's see if Sharon comes out with renewed confidence and Brio following that first boxing round and how it ended. Roger's looking to re-establish the jab. I, um, this is not a very, uh, a sort of boxing intellectual segment. Roger's torso, uh, Roger's torso is looking very shiny, Chris. Sign of sweat, sign of fatigue, perhaps? Uh, it is certainly glistening under the lights of the dome and it shows how much effort he had to put in and perhaps how much he was sweating about his position in the chest as well but Shine is certainly you can see in his eyes he's looking for the opportunity to land that right hand again I mean, I, I, I think we need, to, we, need a, we need a few more headshots here in order to really take the boxing to the next level. Otherwise, otherwise both sides look like they might just kind of survive. Quite often in chess boxing, the, the chess is the dominant factor. And I think here, the fact that White has this easy to play position means that Cheyenne has the luxury of taking his time with the boxing. And Roger really needs to take advantage of that because I can't, I can't see White making a serious enough mistake for uh, for the boxing to not be to not be a big big factor for Cheyenne. Yeah, we're we're going deep here on the chess, I think. Um, and for Roger, what I would like to see is a bit more head movement here. Um, right, he, okay. he's, he's shipping too many arrowing right hands uh, to the chin. Cheyenne just missing with one there, and, but connecting with the hook. And Roger looks in a little bit of trouble again. He's been rocked by that powerful right hand from Cheyenne. I, I, I really, really admired Chey Cheyenne's uh, boxing this round. He just looked, he looks so focused, so focused, so unflappable. Roger is not getting a substantial punch on him, and Roger is looking quite, quite fatigued now. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's taken a lot of, of heavy punishment there. What I would like to see from Roger is either that head movement, which makes it a lot harder to land those shots, or I'd like to see him try and close the distance a little bit more and fight on the inside, because at the moment, with how it's panning out, with this distance that you can see between the two, it's Cheyenne who's able to control it and land the more powerful punches, whereas Rogers is not able to time his, probably because he's so wary of having been caught. You can see he's not even pumping out the jab very much down like he was to start with. At the moment, Roger is looking very flat. Yeah, uh, so this che Cheyenne has basically taken every round so far. The last round of chess, well played by both sides, but White, Cheyenne with a dominant position, and Roger's time is here will surely play a factor in his defence of what is a very, very tricky, tricky game for Black. I mean, we've seen several jaffers, as we've said now. Yeah. Uh, 
yeah, there's a, the danger zone is fast approaching for Roger Wahey. Really has to avoid him. I, I would strongly advise that even if he doesn't feel he needs to take that much time for his first seed when he comes back, just take that extra seconds to refocus because, again, that was really a lot of punishment in that boxing oh, round. You can see him taking big gasps um, of breath. Where Shine, you know, he's very calm there, just taking a, a swig from his corner man. He just looks uh, completely zen and in his zone, like he's just ready to go again. Um, whereas you can see Roger there really gulping in the air, taking big, big guzzles of oxygen, desperately trying to get that into his lungs. Uh, ahead of the resumption of chess. And, and I think from, from a chess perspective, Roger really, really needs to take his time with this first move. Um, it, it is sensibly not a challenging position. Um, yeah. I, yeah, but I mean, there, there's potential threats of, of checkmate moving. I mean, the, there's the pawn on H6, which has stopped knight G5 coming in. Um, but, um, I mean, it's control of both sides of the board, which is why I really like China's position. Yeah, I, 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 it's just very easy to play, and I, in this, this kind of multifaceted sport, you really want a, a straightforward position, particularly when you're doing well in the boxing. Um, Cheyenne can just play and play and play here. Roger needs to take his time, and Cheyenne needs to take his time as well. And we're back! So, where we left it, ladies and gentlemen, White has a slight advantage here. He's doing very, very well in the boxing, and G6, an interesting but very committal move. Now, White has a couple of pawn breaks at his disposal. He can try and move his H pawn to H5, he can try and move his G pawn to G5, but he's played King G2, Chris. What's the idea? So the idea there is that he's clearing some space for his rook that I think he's gonna swing potentially behind those pawns that he's pushing forward. Cheyenne here, he's got some, some great control over the position. He's still got that queen side completely locked down. There are no breaks in the center. Okay, rookie three is interesting. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is a very, very key round for White to show his metal, to show that he really knows how to create a plan. White needs to come up with a pawn break here. Moves like bishop b5, unfortunately, it's going to take Roger a really, really long time to get anything out of this position. Now, if Cheyenne can move his knight, play f4 and potentially f5, then black actually might have a bit of a struggle on his hands. What Roger needs to do is keep an eye on his time where he has a minutes advantage and not make any silly mistakes conserve his energy for the boxing which he's not been doing brilliantly at with his opponents extra technique that extra energy but there's still a lot to play for chris yes so roger also just has to look out for the chance to get some activity it's activity that is the problem there's not really that much of a plan for roger other than to hunker down and make sure that you know a he keeps control of that pawn on c6 and doesn't lose it which is fine he's got the bishop on it at the moment but the B, you know, as the attack starts to develop on the king side, he really needs to make sure that he's alert to that. Yeah, I think Queen, Queen D2 suggests that Cheyenne's struggling to find a quick plan here. And actually, Roger's extra over the board experience might be good. So Knight H2, a really, really useful move. So now, White can play that move F4, which he needs to do in order to get that pawn lever in, that necessary pawn lever, in order to break open Black's Queen king side and possibly force checkmate. Yep, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's the slow attack that's coming. Uh, so Roger reached out, touched his queen, didn't really know where he's going to move it. F4, 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 a great yeah. move. A great move by White, ladies and gentlemen. This has been slow, attritional chess, but very, very high quality here. Roger not really sure what to do. White, yep. if White gets F5 in at the right time, now I think this could be this could be very difficult for him to defend. Normally, normally it's not that advisable to move the pawns in front of your king, but the reason Cheyenne can do this is if you look at those pawns in the center, they're completely locked up against each other. So he doesn't have to watch out for any counter punches, you know, for black breaking open the position and taking advantage of the space around white's king. He can just attack at leisure, maybe a little bit slowly, yeah, just rolling those pawns forward, but he's going to slowly lever open that position. Go. Got a minute to go. Oh, king to g3, I'm not 
sure about that, ladies and gentlemen, because now, now, if the pawn moves to f5, there'll be some lines where it can be taken back with a knight, forking the rook and king, but knight back to g8. I think, I think Roger's flagging. I think Roger's flagging. And what will happen? What has to happen is Shine has to make the most of it, but he's throwing his pawns down the board. He's throwing his pawns down the board. And I know you're not as excited about this as, as me, ladies and gentlemen, but my goodness, my goodness, we could be in for a hunting of an X test round. That's the spirit. That's the excitement we want to hear. And Roger's played F6. Oh, my goodness. He had to do that at some that, point. But uh, no, I, I don't agree. I don't agree. That's some activity. That's a very that risky move. That's a very, activity. very risky move. I think he could have perhaps prepared that a little bit better. And I think White, White is in the driving seat here with eight seconds to go. So Cheyenne, don't rush this. There's no need to commit. There's no need to commit here. There's no need to commit here. Queen H2, and that's the bell! Oh my I, goodness. I, I, I still like F6 then. So I, Roger, I, I think otherwise Roger, he just sits there. And you see the idea behind King G3 was to play Queen H2, H4, H5. I technically from a classical chess position, perspective, you don't want to play F6 and break it open while you're being attacked. But I just think in this chess boxing situation, particularly when you're getting up, you know, you're on the receiving end of it in the boxing, you just have to look for some activity even if it's not the right way to do it because otherwise he's either going to get ground down or knocked out one or the other well but the, the, the thing is though I, I appreciate your point about uh, white playing king g3 and, and queen h2 and so forth but actually moves like um moves like rookie three the shuffling with the knight i'm not convinced that white is committed to any particular strategy and i think given black's time advantage he'd be better not to play committal moves he didn't need to play f6 immediately white wasn't threatening um any pawn break in that position i i, I mean i agree white white is in a much much better position yeah, without, a doubt. But f, without a doubt the problem with f6 is white black if white does nothing he doesn't want to black doesn't want to capture an e5 I guess he wants to play f5 if he can uh, and then try and but he can't get a knight to e6 particularly soon and g6 is going to be weak as well uh, black uh, definitely doesn't want to take on e5 and i think white might just take on f6 and then the e5 square is such a great outpost for the other knight and those knights on c5 and e5 are going to be black gets e4 though uh, but the knight's covering it i don't know we'll maybe re we'll return i guess this. we'll see Th this one's provoked quite the debate between matt and i um, and we will return to that after the boxing, which promises to be just as exciting. Uh, so in both rounds today, Cheyenne has really dominated with that right hand. Um, and also lands in the left hook set. Big trouble here for Roger. Down on, down on the board, down on the... Oh, big, big overhand oh. right there from Cheyenne. He's just landing at will. Roger has to, I think, do what he did in the chest, which is change the nature of the battle, even if it's not sound. <laughs> maybe, maybe, absolutely. I mean, Ch Cheyenne's dominance in the boxing has become very apparent since the end of the first boxing round. And um, and I, I just think fatigue, fatigue seems to be as big a factor as technique here. I, I think Roger has to do the counterintuitive thing here, which is on the receiving end, get closer to the man, you know, take away the distance, make it a kind of fight in a telephone box, because at this distance, Shine is just finding it way easier to land than Rogers. Again, though, it's very easy to land the jab. Yeah, I, I think that, that's a really, really good point, Chris, you made about sometimes you have to do the counterintuitive thing if things are not on your side. And this feels like the kind of boxing bout that is only going one way, that slow, slow grind, unless Roger mixes things up a bit. There is still a bit of time. We still have more boxing to come. But we're only halfway through this round. I can see Cheyenne landing a couple of couple of big blows before the end is out. I mean, Rogers managed to avoid the, the flurries, and he's not been rocked. He's landed a few heavy ones, but he has stabilized it a little bit. I'd like to now see him up the output a bit. Maybe, oh, yeah, okay, hold on, that's good. Just, just hold on a bit. And a good left landed there from Roger. <laughs> Simultaneous jabs, always, always a good one when they both land at the same time. And again, and again. Uh, There's a lot of staggering from Roger now, though. He does not look at all steady on his feet. No, but I think he's he's more solid than he was in the last round. A, a jabbing match suits him. Oh, OK, OK. A okay. jabbing match suits him. It's a little bit slower. Uh, the power's taken out of it. And um, maybe, sh maybe Shine, the effort is just starting to tell a little bit because his output's gone down. 
this round. He still looks just as focused. Well, they're half, half a minute to go, half a minute to go. How has this round gone, Chris? What will you, what will you say? Will Roger go back to the ball, please, with this? Yeah, it's a lot leveler. I think with the boxing now, it's about who wants it more these last 20 seconds. Yeah, can really swing things to the judges as well. If you can demonstrate some aggression in the last few seconds, then that really sways it. And it's Cheyenne who is pouring that aggression on again, as he has in at the end of previous rounds. A couple of concussive rights landing on Roger. Yeah, Ro I, I think Sh Cheyenne has been an impressive character all throughout this bout, but Roger has survived. He survived long enough to have another round of chess, and I think it's going to be a key one, Chris. I survived long enough for us to resume the debate, which I was very much enjoying, uh, about the merits or lack thereof of, of F6. I mean, I am with you on Roger needed to mix up the position. I'm just not convinced that F6 at that time yeah, was the yeah, way to do maybe it. Maybe not the best timing. I, I think I think Black has problems on the queen side with the, with the knights being so powerful on C5 and so unopposed. That knight is stronger than either of Black's rooks in terms, oh, for, in terms of its contribution it's, it's to the, the position. It, it, it's attacking E6. Um, I, I just think I think the issue with F6 is I think a lot of it rests on whether. Black can follow up with F5, which would suggest that F5 would have been a better move than F6, putting the question, do you want to take on Poisson? Um And I, I, I don't know, I don't know. So with a couple of rounds to go, yeah, Shine, big favourite on both the board and in the ring. But we're getting to that point where one mistake can change it. And that position is starting to become a little bit more double-edged. I think the thing is, though, if, if White makes a mistake, it's not going to be de deadly to his position, whereas if Black does. And we are back to the chest. Matt, we were having quite the debate about Roger's last move there. It sharpened up the position. Um, oh. He's making a bid for counterplay too here. Too quick, too quick. There's no need. Roger's got that extra time, and it is important that he puts some pressure. He puts some pressure on. But I think, I think Black... G5! Ooh, G5, Ooh. I don't know. I don't know. So if Black plays F5, F5 locking up the position, F5 locking up... Oh, no. he's taking it. He's no, taking no, it. No, 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 no. I don't like that. No, no, no. I don't like that move at all. Well, I agree. I agree. I don't like that move at all. I think that Black had enough to hold on to G6. So now, if Black plays H5, if Black plays H5, he's done it! He's played H5, and Black's position looks a lot more solid. And what is more, that F4 pawn of White... It's a bit of a weakness, Chris. It's weak, and that F6 move in the exchange has opened up the file. So now the rook on F7 is bearing down on it. The other rook can swing behind it. Chance is, is carrying on with his attack as if it's not happened. I, I, I think Cheyenne might become unpleasantly but surprised by the next flurry of moves by Roger. Roger has a legitimate strategy now. He can target that weak F4 pawn. He can try and swing his knight in to F5, which would be a wonderful outpost akin to the C5 square. Uh, and he's attacking the F4 pawn. He's attacking the F4 pawn. Oh, what a change. Now, it's so rare, Chris, that you have these jaffers, these key mistakes mistakes after the boxing, which are purely positional. But Roger has played some seriously classy chess, some seriously classy chess. Now, if I were white, I would play queen to h3 here, attacking that weak e6 pawn. Yep, counter-attack. Because you're not going to be able to defend that f4 pawn. I mean, you can, but I think not in I, the long run. I think actually, I think actually that e6 pawn is a bit of a factor. The bishop on b5 is contributing nothing to Roger's position. Cheyenne having a thing, but my goodness, my goodness, Chris, Cheyenne is only down to a minute and 20 seconds on the clock, and that could be hugely significant. Come the final round of chess, he's thinking, he's thinking, but his time is ticking away with that grim inevitability of certainty. Oh my goodness, he doesn't have time for this. He doesn't have time for this. He needs he needs to find a move. He needs to find a move. It looks like he's playing. He's, he's over it. He's done it. He's, he's done it. it. That's he's the played best the move. move. He counterattacks. That's the only move. Rather it's than the defending. only move. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness me. With a minute and a half to go, Roger has a big decision on his hand. So he can play rook to f5, blocking the attack. But then knight to h4. Knight to h4 would be a very serious move, and that would win an exchange, ladies and gentlemen. A rook for a knight, which would be very significant. And Roger has to have a think about whether he wants to move a rook back to defend the pawn, and he's done it. He's done it's it. Safe decision. Classy chess. The safe decision. Classy chess by Roger Baxter. 
Knight to h4, my goodness, my goodness me, that's a nice move. I like that enormously. So the pendulum has turned slightly. White, black would ideally like to play knight to e7, coming into f5, but he can't, he can't. That e6 pawn is the dominant factor in this position. Something has gone wrong here, and these are the fine margins that chess games are turned on. What a game, what a game, and what a night, Chris. I could not agree more, Matt. It swung one way, then the other. Roger was coming right back into it. But then with this knight h4, I mean, we often say a knight Oh, no, he's played it! And the e6 ball is dropping! And he's had that's a really significant blow! Knight takes e6, he's played it instantly! And the he's, kick, yeah. Oh, my goodness me, oh, my goodness me. A clear advantage for White. A clear advantage for White, who can move his knight back to that dominant outpost. The problem is, though, the problem is White has 39 seconds and Black has over two minutes. Over two minutes, that's the bell! That's the bell! Oh, my goodness My me. word, back and forth. Um, I mean, positionally, there was a trade of mistakes there. Uh, always difficult to handle that situation where you have the, the, the pawn breaks on, and as white, you want to avoid it becoming locked up. Black had the chance to do that. Um, he could have played f5, but would perhaps have been more opposite. But it actually worked out in his favor, because there was the trade of mistakes um, Cheyenne let the pawn exchange happen in a way that opened up that counterplay against the F-file. And then there was that key moment, Matt, I'd love to hear your views, when Roger went back to defending the pawn on E6, when he could have said, OK, I'll ignore that one and play Rook takes F4. Hard to work out, but what are your views? Well, I, I, I think the issue with Rook takes F4 is that Knight takes E6 is, um, is check, and... It might, I don't think what takes F4 is possible, unfortunately. I think it's a, it's a really interesting one. I, I think Cheyenne made a mistake in allowing the change in the nature of position because he took what was a, a very advantageous position for White where actually Black can no counterplay into a double-edged position where White may have had a small advantage, but it's very difficult to play. Um, Roger has blundered a pawn, but actually, I think the significant factor is the time. It's time, it's going to time. time. It's, I, I don't think White is going to is going to have a happy round trying to play that quickly. Anyway, back to the boxing. Speaking of time, it is uh, the extra one minute in the round, uh, as well as the key factor here in the boxing, because it is a title fight. So three minutes in the round, as opposed to two. And Shine again, landing with those heavy right hands on Roger. Roger needs to do what he achieved in the chess, which is change the dynamic, because this is not working out for him. He can, he can suck. He can kind of suck it up, which is what he's doing. But that's really not the strategy that you, you want. You have to try and find a way of changing the geography of the ring uh, to, to favor you somehow. Yeah, it, it's, it's a really interesting one in the context of the chess boxing overall, because it's perfectly possible that both sides are going into this thinking that they have a practical advantage in the chess. Cheyenne has clearly the better position, probably a winning position, but the time difference might be something that he's not taken into account. So, and especially because it's double-edged. If it, if we were down into a simple end game, yeah, then you know the technique kicks in. But with the double-edged nature of that one, having less time to work out the complications, it's going to make a huge difference here. And Roger knows this, and you can see that despite the onslaught that's coming his way, you can see he looks a lot calmer than in the last round. He's just thinking, okay. Yeah, the boxing is not favoring me, but get through to this one. And even though the chess position is not in my favor, but I've got the better practical chances. But the issue seems to be that neither side is landing a significant punch. They seem tired. They seem really, really out of it. But the punches that are landing are not hammer blows. I mean, Cheyenne certainly landing the heavier punches, particularly with his use of the right hand, mm -hmm. whereas Rogers really because he's on the defensive, Roger's using his right hand more as a blocking tool and relying on the jab. Um, but, yeah, no decisive blows yet on both disciplines. One minute to go, one minute to go. This is it. This is the key moment because there is a very strong chance that we don't see another round of chess. And Sean, as he has done in the previous rounds, he's really waiting until the last minute to really start to pour it onto Roger. I think Roger, uh, there you go again. Uh, uh, it, it was glancing, but it landed on another right hand. Cheyenne, you can see what he's doing. He's conserving a little bit of energy and it comes on in the last 30 seconds.
Roger looks ready to go, but he's just desperate to get through to that last round. Shine, shine, punch out there. What a round. What a round. You know, hats off to Roger. I think he's lost every round, but he has shown guts. He has hung in there. Um, he's also been soaking it up on the chest. So psychologically, to just hang on in there when you know that you're having the worst of it on both disciplines and really just rely on time because it's the clock. If he wins, it's going to be the clock that wins it for him. And that was a very, very brave strategy to go that way. Yeah, I, I, I suspect that White, White took too much time after um, the, the, uh, the Rook moved to F8. Uh, I don't think he saw Queen H3 was an option until after he'd used about a minute on his clock. And that was really key. If he'd, play, if he'd, see, if he'd played Queen H3 instantly, then I think White would be the, uh, the, the have a clear advantage. As it is, the time difference is so great that I think Black, despite having lost every round of the boxing the chess, I think he's going to win because the clock is a big factor, and I think it will be the prevailing factor. And, it, and it's too unbalanced the position to just rely on technique, which Cheyenne has. Yeah, I, I mean White White needs to find a way. I think. I don't know, because if the knight moves back, the trade-off of queens will surely make it harder for white to get a quick checkmate. But it's difficult to see what else you do here. Otherwise, you're just in a self-exerted pin. Um, yeah, and, well, and we, we will been see. Roger. And we are back. Matt, the clock is key here. The, the clock is by far the prevailing factor here. Roger is in a dire position on the board, but white has got 30 seconds left. 30 seconds left, ladies and gentlemen. I, what happened? What on earth has happened there? What was that night move? Oh dear, oh dear, dear. Time is ticking down inexorably. 17 seconds, he's shaking his head. He knows he's won every round. And from a puristic perspective, he has played perfectly. But time, oh, he's blundered a piece. It's all gone horribly wrong. And Roger's oh, taken it. Roger's better it's, on the yeah, chest the, now. The, the, he is going to win this. Time is ticking down. Five seconds. Four seconds! Oh my goodness me, what a turnaround! What a turnaround by the Cannonball! I think this is it! This, I think this is Muhammad Ali esque. He's been on the ropes in the chess and the boxing, and he's gonna win at the last. Oh my goodness me, a classy move. Rook F7, he can do anything here. He could do anything here. I mean, E7's possible. Why not play it? He's done it. The Rook has moved in front. No extra queen for White. He has just seconds. Two seconds. One second, Jolly. And the time oh, got the clock. Won. The clock is run down. Roger at the last is one. Roger Baxter is the British champion. Oh, and an elbow bump. Let's bring, Let's bring it together, guys. Let's bring it together with your rep here. Go to Ronaldo, please. Let's announce the winner properly. Come on, Cheyenne. Let's do this properly. On a time penalty in the chest, the winner is Roger Cannibal Baxter! He has won the British middleweight title! Show off that belt, sir! <laughs> Roger, let's grab a quick word. How are you feeling? Wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out tonight. This is sport. It's been so good to me. And you are the sport. Everyone here, everyone who couldn't make it. Oh, thank you. And thanks to Cheyenne because, my God, my eye is going to really puff up. Oh, he played such a good game. He was like, oh. It was tight. It's a really classy game of chess. Yeah, really tight, really positional, really like trenches. And yeah, I was just quicker. That was all. It wasn't better, it was just quicker. Ooh. A humble win for the Cannonball. And let's also make some noise for our King of Persia. Uh, we're going to have a couple of words with you, sir. Uh, first of all, how are you feeling?
him right now. You put up such a good fight in that chest and in the box. That's it. Phenomenal in loss. We're, we're going to be here back. I want to say thank you for my supporters there. With, woo, to uh, Richard over here, came down from Wellingborough, and our dancers, Jessica and Oakley over there. Thank you also to Gav for organising. Thank you everyone for coming. Woo! You put on such a show for us tonight. I hope you enjoy it at home too. Give it up one more time for our title belt for Zadin Zayim Dolab and Roger Baxter. Well done, guys. Hug it out. And just as a nice treat for everyone, uh, I do need to ask. Uh, how did you choreograph that dance? And do you have any tips for the rest of us? Please. We just went on the floor. No, no. Jessica, she's a queen dancer over there, so... Let's give some love to the dancers. <laughs> and Roger, how do you keep your hair so luscious? I have to eat something orange every day, otherwise I will die. I think between you, you put on an amazing show for us all. Uh, oh, and we've got an extra treat. We are being joined by every chess boxer you've seen tonight. Make some noise for all our chess boxers. They look different with their clothes on, don't they? London Chess Boxing. Follow us on Twitch, subscribe. Also, we have a chess boxing podcast. Listen to that, get your ears round it. Our Instagram is London underscore chess boxing. Uh, Twitter, LDN chess boxing. See what we did there? And we need to say some really, really big thank yous also to the legend that is Terry Marsh. He was awesome tonight. What a privilege to have him here. And also thanks to Dylan Goldsmith, the graphics designer, Christopher Patterson, Lowell Con, staff at Protocol Sports Marketing, and uh, all the amazing graphics that you've seen tonight, especially if you're watching us on Twitch. Also a big thank you to everyone at the Dome, Aaron Soft and his team, the tech staff, the production team, our sponsor, Windsor Aquarial Consultants, and one more time, the fighters! We've really loved having you here tonight. Thank you very much for braving uh, leaving your house. <laughs> Those of you that did, enjoy the rest of your evening. Stick around, take some photos of the awesome placards that we've got. See if you can check them out on Insta. And we'll see you next time. Good night. Matt, what a fight. A title <laughs> bout, and it certainly lived up to its billing. Yeah, I mean, that was one heck of a headline bout. Um, Roger Baxter, so much heart there. A, a series of horrendous positions in both the um, 
the, the boxing and the chess, but he prevailed and he prevailed and he prevailed. And in the end, time was on his side, and that's why he's going home as British champion. That strap adorning his waist, very gracious in victory, I thought. But let's talk a little bit more about that chest, because he really was bottled up, had nowhere to go. He was, he was completely controlled on both sides of the board. Locked down on the queen side, lack of any play in the center, and he was just slowly having those pawns rumbling down to leave her open his king. It takes a lot of nerve to hunker down underneath that pressure, desperately waiting for the counterweight. It was a controversial moment that we talked about, Matt. I'm sure looking back on it, ostensibly it was, or objectively, it was not the right move. You're talking yeah, about F6, you're talking I'm, about pawn to F6. I'm, I'm obsessed with pawn to F6. It's, I think, the wrong move at the right moment in the chess boxing context. Well, I, I think so. And actually, uh, Cheyenne's response to that was what led to this double-edged position where Cheyenne took a really, really long time to find this move, Queen H3. And that's the reason, that's the reason why his time was so low come the final round and Roger held on. So, oh my goodness. Well, I, I can't wait for the next event, quite frankly, which is 3rd of October, October 5th. Come along to Tufnell Park. Uh, the dome it's right by the station if you can't then you can follow us on twitch twitch.tv forward slash london chess boxing as jem mentioned we have a podcast which contains interviews with fighters with commentators with authors chess boxing enthusiasts etc we're on instagram at london underscore chess boxing our twitter is at ldn chess boxing oh my goodness matt a long night awaits us of debating the merits and demerits of f6 all I would like to add to what you've just said, though, before that, is another thank you to Terry Marsh, the legend who we were really privileged to have join us in the commentary box here. And to reiterate Gemma's thanks, so Dylan Goldsmith, graphics designer Christopher Patterson, Laurel Cowell, and the staff at Protocol Sports Marketing, who really have upped our game graphically, I have to say, that was... It's been glorious. It's been such a privilege to, uh, to commentate in this atmosphere. And uh, honestly, they've done a tremendous job. Exactly. Also thank, obviously, the stuff, the Dome here, wonderful atmosphere. They've always uh, hosted us well. It really is becoming the home of chess boxing. Matt, we really are out of time. Uh, <laughs> a beer and a discussion about F6 awaits. Thank you for joining us at home. Um, and we look forward very much to seeing you next time in October, October 1st.